resilient, she thought as she got out of the car. She'd take it. Chapter 16 The hostess, who might have been old enough to buy a legal beer, greeted Trey with a quick, flirty smile. Heard you were coming in. She flicked Sonia a look caught between wistful and envious. With a friend. Sonia, this is Hallie. Sonia Poole? McTavish, Sonia corrected. Right. I meant you're up at the manor. Wow. Welcome to the lobster cage. Your table's ready. She picked up two menus, the wine list, then escorted them through the dining area to a corner table for two. Ian will be your server tonight, she continued as Trey helped Sonia with her coat. Enjoy. Oh, Trey, my dad really appreciates your help with the, you know. Give him my best. I will. Ian will be right with you. She's crushing on you. She's 20. And still, she's a very pretty girl, so you get points for not flirting back. She's 20, Trey repeated. Their server, short, wiry, with orange-streaked dark hair twisted into a top knot, arrived with a cheerful smile. Hi, Trey. Welcome, Ms. McTavish. I'm Ian, and I'll be taking care of all your culinary hopes and dreams tonight. How's it going, Ian? Going good. Grinning, Ian made a check mark in the air with his finger. Aced it. I never had a doubt. That makes one of us. Can I start you off with drinks? A bottle of water for the table? Wine? Trey asked Sonia. That's a yes. He skimmed down the wine list. We'll take a bottle of the Sauvignon Blanc, if that works. It definitely does. He added a bottle of water before Ian walked off. So, since you know everybody, what did he ace? Short version, Ian's dad got sick a couple years ago, so he dropped out of college to come home and help out. Got his degree online, and now he's working on his master's. In what? Environmental engineering. Ian's bright and committed. On behalf of planet Earth, I'm grateful. His dad? In remission. That's good. A busser delivered the water and had a quick word with Trey before Ian brought the wine. The lady will taste it. Trey tells me you're working on your master's in environmental engineering. Yes, ma'am. I did some graphics work for green engineering and environmental in Boston. Ian lit up as he drew the cork. That's one of the best. Tops my list when I'm ready to send out resumes. When you're ready, you could let me know. I'll put in a word. His jaw dropped a full inch. Seriously? I can't promise it'll have weight, but it can't hurt. I, wow, that would be awesome. When he poured the wine, she sampled. And this is perfect. Ian ran through the night specials, then backed off to give them time. First, you made his night, possibly his month. Second, you'd put in a word for a server you just met? You said he was bright and committed, so he is. He put his family first, which shows loyalty and heart. If we're going to save the planet, we need the bright, committed, loyal, and plenty of heart. We're on the same page there. Now, let's get down to immediate priorities. You eat here all the time. What should I order? I'm thinking the lobster ravioli. I could go with that. No, you can't. How can I mooch off your plate if you get what I get? And vice versa. I see. Considering she perused the menu. I feel a pull toward the crab-stuffed lobster tails. Surrender to it. You won't be sorry. You should go with the mashed potato puffs with that. If you want a starter. How am I supposed to eat the main potato puffs and the lemon-grilled asparagus if I have a starter? Fine. But you need the jalapeno hush puppies. I have to be firm on that. Deal. She closed her menu. My plans, loose as they were, included opening a can of tomato soup and making a grilled cheese sandwich. One of my personal staples. I'm a grilled cheese master. Is that right? I've never met a grilled cheese master. She leaned forward. Tell me more. Pepper jack cheese, sourdough bread, and chili oil. You'll thank me later. After Ian took their order, she sat back, picked up her wine. So, lawyer, grilled cheese master, teenage rocker, what else should I know? 
How about where you studied law? Cambridge. On a laugh, she leaned forward again. You went to Harvard Law? Guilty. I dated a Harvard Law student once for about five minutes. It wasn't you, was it? I'm pretty sure I'd remember. I didn't think so, because he was full of himself. Which is why the five-minute relationship. If you were full of yourself, you'd have found a way to work in Harvard the first time we met. I dated an artist once. It was more like ten minutes. Inexplicable abstracts and a weird obsession with Virginia Woolf. Definitely wasn't me. I'm more thrillers, fantasy, and a side of romance where the bad guys get what's coming to them. The world is saved and love eventually conquers. I like the spooky too, but I'm giving that a pass for now, considering. Probably a good idea. You said you fell asleep reading last night. What were you reading? It wasn't the book's fault. We'll lay it on a long work day in the gold room. Rabbit hole. New author to me. I've only just started, but it's really good. I just read it last week. It's going to get even better. They talked books and ate lobster, segued into movies as Sonia became a passionate fan of the jalapeno hush puppy. She couldn't remember the last time she'd had such an easy, wide-ranging conversation with a man over a meal. That was amazing. Now I have to work out tomorrow, which is totally on you. You're all right going down to the gym? It's my house. She's got one room, and that's temporary. But it's my house. I'm thinking of asking Cleo to talk to her grandmother about a juju or mojo or whatever the hell it is. Is that a serious thing? Cleo's grandmother is serious about it. I met her when we spent an amazing spring break in New Orleans. She's fascinating. And spooky. Fascinatingly spooky, not scary spooky. She read my palm, my cards, tarot. What did your future hold? Some of it's more reading into who you are and what you're looking for. She was pretty damn accurate, but I put that down to her reading people well and knowing me through Cleo. Then you get to meeting the tall, dark stranger or going on a long sea voyage and... She trailed off as Ian came back with dessert menus. Pulling herself out of the memory, she smiled at him. Just where would I put it? Between the two of them, they talked her into a cappuccino and the signature housebred pudding. And? Trey prompted. You thought of something before. It's strange. I haven't thought of any of it for years. She said I'd face a betrayal, which would hurt but provide a fortunate escape and open opportunities. I'd be wise to take both. And that I'd make my home in a house of history and secrets overlooking the sea. She picked up her water glass. Looks like she was pretty damn accurate on that part, too. Spooky, she repeated and drank. I never believed any of it. Any of the, well, spooky stuff before I came here. How do you feel about it? Yet to be determined, she shrugged. Or partially. I love that house, Trey. Like Yoda, it was love at first sight, which I also didn't believe in before I saw the house or Yoda. Practicality or cynicism? Maybe a little of both. And I insist on maintaining at least some of both. That and your resiliency will help you deal with what's in the house. Charmed, simply charmed, she shook her head. You're not even the tiniest bit, we'll say, cynical about the manor. I grew up with it, and to some extent in it. You've had about a month. He glanced over as a woman with short, boldly red hair arrowed toward their table. The white chef's coat gave her away. Interrupting, mind. She snugged into the booth beside Sonia. Brie Marshall. Sonia McTavish, Trey told me you were a wonderful chef. He didn't say you were a goddess in the kitchen. I like you, I like her, she said to Trey. Ian brought the coffee and dessert. Can I get you something, chef? No, I'm only on a short break. We're winding down, thank Christ and all his followers. I just need Trey for one quick minute. It's not private. Eat, she added and waved at the dessert plates. Manny, she said to Trey. Manny? What about him? 
I had a beer with him a week or so ago. He's fine, right? Sure, right. Manny and me. Manny and you what? Oh. Now Trey sat back. When did this happen? It hasn't yet. Completely. Just around the edges. You know me, you know him. She turned to Sonia. We all go back. High school. Trey and I had a thing in high school. Don't worry about that. I wasn't. Good, confident, like her even more. We, Trey and I, had not even what you'd call a thing a few years later. Not to worry there, either. I won't. Bree. Trey managed to infuse the single syllable with deep frustration, mild embarrassment, and endless affection. Right, back to it. Manny and me. A friend. You know, Marley, talked me into going over to a Ogonquit a couple weeks ago. Rock Hard had a gig. Rock Hard's Manny's band. He's a drummer. I don't know if the name's a reference to the main coast, the music, or Woody's, since they're an all-male band. Jesus, Bree. Sorry. As Trey rubbed his face, Bree turned to Sonia again. Was that offensive? Not in the least. Sounds to me like it could be all three. Bree jabbed a finger at her. Bet you're right. Anyway, Manny used to drum for Trey's band back in the day. Headcase. Headcase? On a rolling laugh, Sonia picked up her cappuccino. I love it. They weren't bad. So I went to Manny's gig. They're solid. Trey, you've heard them. And Manny and I hung out some, and things clicked. Not that way. What do you take me for? I said nothing. You thought it. Then he came in the other night, hung around until closing, and more clicked. Still, not that way, but... So what do you think? Yes or no? If I say yes and things go bad, you'll be pissed. If I say no and it's what you want, you'll be pissed. So I'm going to say you're both friends of mine, both all grown up and don't need anyone's permission to... Click. I screwed up before. Bree, no you didn't. You got out of a bad relationship because you're not an idiot. My ex-husband turned out to be a scumbag who cheated on me with my sous chef. I caught my ex-fiance banging my cousin in our bed a couple months before the wedding. Okay, you win. I like Manny. I've always liked Manny. I don't want to mess him up. Then you won't, Trey told her. Then I won't. She nodded, pushed out. I've got to get back to the wars. Bring her in again. I like her. As Bree errored away again, Sonia spooned up some bread pudding. I can see why you had a thing with her. Twice. The second time wasn't really a thing. I can see why. So if I take a vow of silence, will you tell me what you think about Bree the chef and Manny the drummer? I think I wonder why it took him this long. He's had a soft spot for her for years. That's nice. And it's nice you didn't tell her that. It keeps things balanced between them. So, she took another bite of bread pudding. Head case? Nearly three hours after they'd driven away from the house, he parked beside her car. I didn't know how much I needed this. You did. Everybody needs a break. The lamp's on in my bedroom, she noted as she got out of the car. I'll go up and check. No need, really. My chambermaid? I don't know what to call her. I assume her. She does that every night when she turns down the bed, puts the fire on. And from the sound of it, the dogs are on guard. The barking stopped the minute she opened the door. Both dogs greeted them as if they'd been separated for months. I'll walk them around. I could use the walk too. Instead of getting the leash, Sonia pointed at Yoda. I'm trusting you to stick to the program. It didn't take long to realize. He'd not only stick to the program, but very close to Mookie, his new best friend. Thanks for every bit of this, she said when they walked back to the door. Please don't expect anywhere near the same level of cuisine on Friday. We're looking forward to it. All of us. Cole, he insisted. Anytime. No bullshit on that, Sonia. Message received. She knew when a man was about to kiss her, and he wasn't. So she scooped up the dog and opened the door. Thanks again. I'll see you Friday. Good night. 
Inside, she snuggled the dog, leaned back against the door. Tonight's music choice, Peter Gabriel's In Your Eyes. It wasn't a date. The next afternoon, she bundled Yoda in the car. Armed with her mother's shopping list, she drove to the market for the supplies needed for the dinner party. She now feared more than the room on the third floor. She took Yoda into the flower shop, much to the delight of the florist. She sent flowers from Yoda to his foster family. And left with flowers and the possibility of another client, thanks to the work she'd done on practical art. Another stop at the bookstore netted her more candles and a book Trey had recommended over dinner. Since she'd be cooking a lot the next day, she made one more stop for a takeout pizza. After bringing in the flowers, bookstore bag, and pizza, she let Yoda walk off his time in the car before hauling the groceries in. When she shut the door the last time, her in-house DJ greeted her with the moody blues and lovely to see you. I can't say the same because big laugh, I can't see you. When she carried the groceries into the kitchen, the flowers and pizza were gone. The bookstore bag neatly folded with her new book on top. What the actual fuck? As she dumped the groceries, she saw the warming light on the oven glowed red and found her pizza inside. Dragging off her knit cap, she turned. There on the big dining table, her flowers spilled artistically out of a low oval dish with the new candles arranged just as artistically on the mantel. Should I be thankful that might be better than I could have done or just a little pissed off? She decided she could be both and went in to put away the groceries before somebody else did it for her. You know, she said to the dog, who was busy gnawing on his new chew bone. I was going to hire a cleaning service, but somebody else already keeps it all cleaned and polished. She decided to work through the evening, so had pizza at her desk, with the fire she hadn't lit crackling. She completed the proposal for the Doyles, worked up another for the florists. As an experiment, she deliberately left her plate and empty glass behind when she shut down for the night. A light snow fell as she walked the dog. He amused her by leaping at it, turning in his happy circles. When she rounded back, she noted the lamp glowed against the glass in her bedroom. No doubt the fire would glow as well. The bed turned down. No light in that third floor room, but she wondered if the glass held darker there than all the other windows. Back inside, she walked up, turned first to the library. No plate, no glass on the desk. And in her bedroom, a turned down bed, a low fire, and the quiet light to guide her way. She planned out her dinner party day, not like a general prepping for battle, but like a lowly recruit who'd been inexplicably field promoted. Stage one, marinate the giant's lab of cow, then say a desperate prayer she hadn't screwed that up. Stage two, work until noon and pretend she had no other tasks. Stage three, put on an apron, line up all the ingredients, and face the music. Literally, as her tablet played Lil Wayne's No Worries. Easy for you to say. 20 minutes later, she FaceTimed Cleo. Hey, hi. Can you take a break? Sure. Is everything all right? I'm cooking. I'm afraid. Mom said to brown the hell out of the roast, so I did. Does this look right? She turned the screen so it showed the roast resting on a platter. I guess. This is above my pay grade. No one would pay me to cook, so it's definitely above my pay grade, but it looks right. Is it done? This early? No, no, I'm peeling potatoes and carrots, and I've got to do celery and onions. I need moral support. I'm here for that. Then talk to me. How's the purging and packing going? Purging's harder than I thought. Not the big stuff, but all my pretty little things. I don't want to part with my pretty little things. Then don't. We've got the room. I'm boxing some up to send with winter next weekend. And I'm having a yard sale. Your mom's lending me her yard for the big stuff. Son, you look stressed. I'm cooking. She said it as if she were hacking her way through a jungle full of sound and snakes. I have to do all these vegetables, then sort of stir them around in the meat juices. Herbs. I need to do the herbs. I'm supposed to scrape up all the brown stuff? What does that mean? Look at the size of this pot. 
She turned the screen again, then attacked the pot with a wooden spoon. Oh, there is brown stuff. Look at that. Magic. Listen, everything's smooth here. Jess has taken over the apartment. Jess and Ryan? Your place is a lot smaller than theirs. They broke up. Bad breakup, and she's moving on. Jess and Ryan, and Boston in general, seemed a world away. When did that happen? About three weeks ago, and he's already seeing someone else. Since she moved in with him, she moved out, and she's already moved some of her things in here. Trust me, I'm ready to get out. Send vibes for the yard sale. If it works, I can pack up the rest in two, maybe three days, and then I'm heading to Maine. Where's our puppy? Sonia stopped long enough to hold the screen down. Yoda angled his head back and forth as Cleo cooed at him. I need to tell you about the room on the third floor, the gold room. I need to tell you before you do that yard sale and pack the rest. What about it? Sonia started at the beginning as she quartered potatoes, chopped herbs. Sonia, why didn't you call me? Now you sound like Trey. You should have called him. He's a lot closer than I am. Just stay away from that room. Trust me. But you have to know there's something there, Cleo. Not like the rest. I think it's evil. I hear myself saying that and want to roll my eyes, but I do. I think it's evil. Then we'll get rid of it. We'll find a way. I'm glad Trey was there too. Well, experience it. There are more of us, Sonia. He said something like that. That Dobbs is outnumbered. He's so damn steady. He took me out to dinner after. What? On screen, Cleo threw up her hands. That was days ago and I'm just hearing about it. You had a date with the sexy lawyer. It wasn't a date. I'll be the judge of that. Tell all. Hold on, I have to put everything in this pot and stir it and cook it for a few minutes. Cook and talk. In a second. Oh God, there's so much. Is it too much? I can't think about it. I'm just stirring. We went to the lobster cage. I met his ex. Awkward. No, not. I liked her. You'd like her. She's the chef there. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Plus, I forgot to tell you about the red dress. You wore the red dress? That's a date dress. I didn't, but one of the inhabitants laid it out on the bed before the meeting. I wore the green midi. That looks great on you. So, dinner. She went through it, felt the tension drop as Cleo laughed at the band names. I already like the chef, especially since she's smart enough to like you. I wouldn't mind having her here now. I think this looks like it's supposed to. I have to put this big slab of meat on top of everything and pour in an entire bottle of red wine. A whole bottle? I wish I was there now because I bet that's gonna be amazing. And because I wish I could tell you in person, Sonia, you had a date with the sexy lawyer. Because she had to admit she wished it had been, she shrugged. He didn't make any moves. Did you? No. But he may be a client, and I'm already sort of a client, and he's being such a good friend. I don't wanna mess that up. And God, Cleo, he's so attractive, so appealing, so just, well, yum. I don't want him to be the rebound guy. He deserves better than rebound guy. Sonia, you broke it off with the cheating asshole over six months ago. Seven. Over seven months ago, you're way past rebound territory. Do you think? Absolutely. And you weren't in love with the cheating asshole. I thought I was. I was going to marry the cheating asshole. Which would have been a mistake. Because cheating asshole, and you didn't love him. He didn't break your heart, Zone. He broke your trust and insulted you. And that's way, way different. The client thing? Neither of you has a position of power over the other, so toss that one. If you want to make a move, make a move. If you want him to, let him know you're open to it. You know how. Maybe. First, I have to get through tonight. It's all in there now. All in the biggest pot in the universe of pots. What happens now? I put the lid on it, put it in the oven, and according to Winter McTavish, I forget about it. For hours. Leave it alone for hours. Then your work is done.
Mostly. Mom gave me a recipe for biscuits, but I bailed there and bought Parker House Rolls. There's no shame in the store-bought Parker House Roll. Good, because my nerves couldn't take the biscuits. And Anna texted me earlier in the week. She's bringing dessert. Thank tiny baby Jesus. And you for holding my hand, virtually through this process. Next time, we'll hold each other's in person. Wow, this is really heavy. I think I made enough to feed most of Pools Bay. And now it's in there. Done. Don't peek. Hours. Now go for a walk with our sweet Yoda. Good idea. Yard sale vibes heading your way. Text me later. Let me know how tonight goes. See you inside two weeks. Cleo, out. After she disconnected, Sonia caught herself reaching for the oven door. No, I'm not going to peek in under a minute. Let's clean this disaster up, Yoda, and take that walk. As she started to deal with the unquestionable mess she'd made, she heard a mechanical hum. What the hell was that? Did you hear that? With Yoda at her heels, she followed the hum into the butler's pantry. That's the dumbwaiter, isn't it? Oh shit, that's the dumbwaiter. I I think it's coming back up now. Coming back up from downstairs. She clasped her hands together while the dog sniffed at the cabinet. He didn't growl, not even when she heard a soft thunk and the humming stopped. I have to look, don't I? It's my house, fuck it all. So I have to look. Then I have to deal with... I don't know until I look. She stepped forward and after a long breath, pulled the cabinet door open. Inside sat a large serving platter with painted copper handles and rim. A dozen star-shaped flowers circled that rim with a single one centered. Carefully, as if it might explode at her touch, she lifted it out. Well, it's beautiful. It sort of has a blue luster, right? It looks old and... She turned it over. Jesus, it's Limoges. This is hand-painted. Look here, it was a wedding gift. It's painted on the back. For Elizabeth on her wedding day, June 12th, 1916. She was one of the brides, Sonia murmured. I remember her name from the book. On the family tree, Deuce did. I guess someone thinks I should use it. As carefully as she'd taken it out, she set it on the counter in the butler's pantry. And I guess I could. It's too beautiful to just sit down there in storage. From her tablet, David Bowie sang, Right. Sonia pressed her fingers to her eyes. Gotta overlook the creepy. I don't know how, but I really have to do that. So, we're going to clean up this mess, then take a walk. A nice, long, quiet walk. And if that damn pot roast doesn't completely fail, we'll use Lisbeth's platter. Chapter 17 After dealing with the mess, after the long, calming walk with Yoda, Sonia peeked a couple of times. But what amazed her was the scent, and the scent permeating the house was gorgeous. It boosted confidence when she moved to a new stage. Dress for dinner. She went with a navy cowl neck paired with tights and booties, then spent far too long working her hair back into a French braid, which reminded her she had to make the firm decision about a stylist soon. Door slammed on the third floor loudly enough to make her jump and for Yoda to snap out a series of barks. She's just trying to get us upset, so we won't be. We're going down. I'm going to make a nice charcuterie board. I'm good at that one. Picking up the dog. She rubbed her cheek to his as she walked. We're going to set a really pretty table. Something else I'm good at. As she reached the landing, the slamming became a pounding. Her heartbeat matched it, but she continued down. It's like a tantrum, that's all. A bitch fest. Outside, the sound of the sea became a roar, and a sudden, vicious gale hurled rain and sleet against the windows. In her arms... The dog whined and trembled. She clutched him tight, maybe a little too tight as her pulse jumped and raced. It's not real. It's like the night with the blizzard that wasn't there. And still, goose flesh popped out on her arms. Not real, not real, she repeated over and over in her head. 
Something pounded against the front door. So hard she thought for a moment, she saw the wood bow. She's pissed. She's pissed because I'm opening the house to people. But it's my house! She shouted it and strode back to the kitchen. On the counter, the iPad played, Don't Worry Baby. Warmth filled the room, and what felt like a presence. She turned, half expecting to see someone behind her. Yoda stopped trembling, yipped, then wiggled to leap out of her arms. He danced in place, turned his circles, then sat and lifted a paw. To nothing she could see. That's supposed to be comforting, reassuring. Maybe it will be when I've got my breath back. I'm going to set the table. Once she had, the pounding stopped. Had she given up for now, Sonia wondered. Either way, the quiet soothed. Confident there, she arranged the charcuterie, then slid the board in the fridge while she dealt with her mother's final instructions. Yes, it smelled amazing, she thought, and looked damn good when she put the meat on Lisbeth's platter. But, carefully, she sliced half of it, then one more small, thin slice. We're going to sample, she said to the dog, who sat hopefully at her feet. Half for you, half for me. She laughed when he licked his lips, then fed him half. Though he all but inhaled it, licked his lips again, she took a careful bite. Oh, jeez, it's good. I think it's good. No, that's all she added when he whined for more. For now. She arranged the medley of vegetables around the roast, tossed on some sprigs of fresh rosemary. Grabbing her tablet, she took a picture. All but dancing in place herself, she texted it to her mother, to Cleo, before hauling the platter into the second oven to stay warm. I'm supposed to thicken all this juice into a smooth, thin gravy. I wish I didn't have to, but if it doesn't work, we toss it out. Nobody has to know. She thought she managed it. She opened a bottle of red wine to let it breathe, added a pitcher of spring water. Pretty little plates and napkins for the appetizers she'd serve in the kitchen. Friendly. She started to go in and light the candles in the dining room, but somebody had beaten her to it. He, she, they were just trying to be helpful, she told herself. And the assist was worlds better than banging and pounding. At seven, she set out the charcuterie and turned down the volume on her tablet. Music's fine, she said to whoever listened, but we're going to keep it nice and low. Background. She took off her apron, hung it up, then took a long look around. It's going to be fine. Still, Yoda's barks and race to the door just before the sound of the doorbell made her jump. Showtime. When she reached the door, she pointed at Yoda. Friends, then opened it to Anna and a man a full head taller holding a cake carrier. Anna moved straight in for a hug. I just missed you in town yesterday, in the market. And this is Yoda. Hello, handsome. And this handsome's all mine. Sonia, Seth, Seth, Sonia. With his oak brown hair, sculpted features, and hazel eyes, he earned the handsome. Nice to finally meet you even though you're partially responsible for Anna working longer hours. Sales are up, Anna said. I think that's the art and artist's fault. Let me take your coats. At least one of us was close behind, saw the headlights. Oh, it's a convoy of Doyles. We're never late for dinner. Doors slammed upstairs. I'm sorry about that. Seth glanced up as Anna laid a hand on her belly. I visited Colin with Anna a few times, but never heard. I hope you can ignore it. I'm so glad all of you could come. Ace and Paula came next, bearing flowers. They made a striking couple, he with his flirtatious smile, she with her easy elegance and short, sleek swing of white hair. Then Deuce and Corinne, who offered a bottle of wine. Corinne, with eyes of blue steel and silver-streaked black hair, nearly matched her husband's height. Then Trey, more flowers, came in behind them, and it occurred to her she should have invited him to bring a plus one, but found she couldn't regret not doing so. Besides, he'd brought Mookie, who made Yoda delirious with joy. Within minutes, the kitchen filled with people, 
voices, flowers, wine. Something slammed hard overhead. Someone's at it again, Corinne said easily. Does it worry you? I'm learning to live with it. Corinne nodded, popped an olive. Can I say, well, I'm going to. The house feels different with you in it. Not like a widower too often alone, but younger and fresher. And sexist or not, just a bit female. So here's to you, the lady of the manor. Thank you, Sonia said as glasses lifted. I love it. I'll love it even more, I think, when my friend moves in. The illustrator? Paula nodded and smiled. We hear all there is to hear. Know all there is to know. Ace wiggled his eyebrows. And I know something in here smells good enough to eat. Let's hope so. I'm not much of a cook. She gestured toward the dining room. Ace, please take the head of the table. Trey, could you give me a hand? It's a big platter. When she opened the oven, he took one look, then gave her a long one. You made that. Through my terror, yes. I'm going to open more wine and get the gravy. And the rolls. Almost forgot the rolls. And I thought I could lure the dogs into the living room with a couple of chew bones. I already did that. They're settled. She glanced around, realized no dogs roamed underfoot. When Trey carried the platter in, she heard Ace's, Now that's what I call a roast. She brought in the rest. It looks magnificent, Paula told her. Let's hope for good enough. It's a really big platter, so I'd like to plate everyone at the table. She moved to Paula. A little bit of everything, thank you. No need to be stingy with me. You can load me up, Ace told her. Now that you've had some time, Deuce began as she worked her way around the table. How are you liking Pools Bay? Not just the manor, but the village, the area. I like it very much. I never really expected to move out of the city, or far from it in any case. It's a big change, but it feels right for me. I like everything. She sat, then looked up at another slam. Or almost everything. Seth looked up with her. I'm not sure I could get used to that. I'll let you know if I do. Right now, I'm trying to figure out how my mother is going to react when she's here next weekend. And since no one made gagging noises as they ate, Sonia concluded she'd done well enough on the meal. I'm sure she'll be delighted to see you. Corinne sipped from her water glass. And where you're making your home. Does she know the history of the house? I've given her bits and pieces. I've been reading the book, Sonia said to Deuce. The Poole family history. And I've been documenting the... Incidents. That shows a practical nature, Corinne commented, then took another bite of beef. That would be helpful in a move like this. Pools Bay and the manor are a world away from Boston. A good quality for a woman building her own business, I think. Honesty would be another key, wouldn't it? If you're not honest with a client, you'll lose the client. Corinne nodded as she ate. Honesty in business and in personal matters is essential to building relationships. And yet, you weren't honest with us. I, I'm sorry? You said you weren't much of a cook, and I'm finding myself just a little irked that your pot roast is better than mine. It is, isn't it, Deuce? I take the fifth. And we all know what that means. Now she picked up her wine, and those steel blue eyes shifted to Sonia. I think false modesty is just a dangling hook for compliments. I think you just gave me one, Sonia said, as Anna didn't bother to smother a laugh. And on my first attempt at pot roast. This is your first? And to think I was disposed to like you. Well, I want your recipe. It's actually my mother's, but check with her. She may not want to share outside of family. But if she will, I'll trade my pound cake recipe for it, which I don't offer lightly. She does not, Deuce confirmed. You'll sample that for dessert, if anyone has room after this meal. Anna made it for tonight. Do you bake? I put frozen pizza in the oven. <laughs> That's the height of my baking skills. Wait, I warmed up these rolls without burning them. Corinne smiled. I expect living up here, you'll learn enough to get by. 
I'm hoping my friend Cleo handles most of that end of things. An illustrator, Paula said. It's so nice to add more artists to the community. They talked art and food, local events and impressions. And with conversation, the fire simmering, second helpings and a fresh bottle of wine, Sonia put her first dinner party at the manor in the success column. I thought we'd have coffee and dessert in the music room. What a lovely idea. It's one of my favorite rooms, Paula told her. Would you play, Grandma? She smiled at Anna. I could be persuaded. Why don't we let the younger generation deal with that? Corinne rose, and I'll start persuading. We know the way, she said to Sonia. Sonia got busy with the coffee. I wasted a lot of nerves on tonight. You've got a great family. We do, and the meal didn't hurt. It was better than mom's, and if you tell her I said that, Trey added, I'll sue you for slander. Lips sealed. Oh, God, Anna, that cake's gorgeous. Tastes even better, Seth told her. Do you want me to start on the dishes? I have experience. And I may call on it before we're done. But let's leave all that for later and keep this party rolling. As music drifted in, she glanced toward the doorway. She really can play. It's the first time I've heard the piano when I know someone's playing it. You hear piano music when there's not? She shrugged at Seth. Sometimes, <laughs> late at night. A rich baritone joined the piano. That's Ace. Obviously familiar with the kitchen, the butler's pantry, Anna got out cake plates, coffee cups, and saucers. They're a hell of a pair. Together, they loaded up the dessert cart, a first for Sonia. When they rolled it into the music room, she saw dogs piled together at Deuce's feet. Ace stood with his hand on his wife's shoulder, singing, one for my baby. When they finished, she applauded. You're hired. Do you play, Sonia? Sonia shook her head as Paula played some sort of trill. My mother plays. Not like that, but she plays a little. When she tried to teach me, we both agreed my talents lay elsewhere. Do one more before dessert, Anna insisted. Do embraceable you. Are you up for a duet, sweets? Paula glanced at Ace over her shoulder. I could be persuaded. I asked them to sing this at my wedding, our first dance. I've still got the moves. Seth turned Anna into a dance. It meant the world to them to sing at Anna's wedding, Corinne murmured. Their voices just mesh, don't they? They do. Deuce grew up in a musical household. He can play and he has a strong voice. I have no musical talent. Yours lay elsewhere, in your photography, your family. They do. Joanna played. Glancing over, Sonia saw Corinne studying the portrait. You were friends. We were. Trey told me you'd found her portrait. Seeing it, it's like time stopped. They'd like that you put her in here. This was one of her favorite rooms, too. It felt like the right place. Because it is. She surprised Sonia by linking their hands for a moment. She'd never hurt you. Do you? Do you think she's here? We'll talk sometime. I'll help with the coffee. I know how everyone likes it. Since she felt she had to leave it at that, Sonia sliced cake. Anne considered the idea of post-dinner in the music room a perfect choice when Anna sat down to play and dragged a clearly reluctant tray with her to add his voice. Anna stopped abruptly and with wide eyes pressed a hand to her belly. Seth had already shoved up from his chair when her face lit up like the sun. I felt him move. I felt the baby move. Though she gripped Seth's hands, she looked at her mother. Mom. You're okay? Seth pressed his hand over hers. I don't feel anything. Too early for you to feel, Corinne told him as those steel blue eyes went damp. Right about on time for Anna. It's normal? Trey gripped his sister's free hand. It's a good thing. It's a normal, lovely thing. When do I get to feel him? A few more weeks, Daddy. Because it seemed like a family moment, Sonia slipped out. She'd give them a few minutes and get the dishes started. She walked into the kitchen and found it spotless. The dishwasher hummed, the sink sparkled, 
and when she checked the fridge, she found the leftovers, a fraction of what she'd feared and expected, efficiently tubbed. I... Oh, jeez. I appreciate it. You didn't have to do all this. She still stood at a loss when Trey came in. No way you're this fast on KP. No, not me. Well, okay. I think everyone's going to head out. I was going to stay and give you a hand with all this, but no need for that. On cue, the tablet played stay. She heard the nerves in her own laughter. Somebody likes having you around. Yoda came in, danced, whined. Oh, you want to go out? Of course you do. Give me one minute. I've got him. Mookie's going to want to go out with him. And when I say they're about ready to head out, it always takes a while for them to actually get out. He wasn't wrong. Seth, be a good boy and take the cart back to the kitchen for Sonia. Ace and I should take our old bones home. As Corinne said, we'll leave the younger generation to help with the cleanup. It seems someone from what must be a much older one already took care of that. You're not kidding? Anna patted Seth's butt. Come on, I'll go with you. I'll protect you and get my cake carrier. I ain't afraid of no ghosts, he said as he wheeled the cart away. Myself, I wouldn't mind an invisible maid. But, Corinne added, it must be disconcerting. A time and energy saver, and yeah, disconcerting's one word for it. I have, by my current count, the maid, a house disc jockey, a firewood hauler, the door slammer, the piano player. At least one of them likes dogs because they taught Yoda to shake. I need to write all that down, too. When you do, if I could see it. With what I know of the family and house history, Deuce told her, I might be able to help identify some of the occupants. Sure, I'll send it to you once I get it together. You're a sturdy young woman. Paula offered a hand, then closed her other around Sonia's. And we had an absolutely wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Sonia got coats as Trey brought Yoda back. I put Mook in the car. They wore each other out. He lingered in the foyer as his family left. You're okay? Yes. And if you're not? I'll call. This was great. And I think you're what the house needs. I hope it's what you need. She felt her heart flutter just a little as he stood close with his eyes direct on hers. It feels like it. Good. I'll see you soon. She closed the door behind him. He was thinking about it. I'm not wrong about that. He was thinking about making a move. She looked down at the dog. Should I have made the move? I'm gun shy, that's what it is. I have to get over it. But tonight, I'm pretty worn out too. Let's go to bed, Yoda. She dreamed someone played the piano, but not in the music room. In the front parlor, Astrid played something lively and quick. An older woman sat by the fire, working with a needle and an embroidery hoop while she tapped her foot in time. In the grate, a log fell, embers flew. Colin Poole stood beside Astrid and turned the page on her music. Someone had pushed the furniture back, so three couples formed two lines, weaving back and forth as they danced. She recognized what had to be Colin's twin, Connor. And the way he looked at his partner, she knew her for Arabelle, the woman he'd marry, the doomed Catherine's mother. But young now, all of them, except the woman by the fire. And she saw the man sitting nearby, smiling, sipping his whiskey as he watched the dancers. Astrid's parents, she thought. Not certain why she felt so sure of it. She moved through the room, a ghost among ghosts. She smelled the flowers, roses from the hothouse, the candle wax made by a family in the village, the wood smoke from the logs a servant named John split and stacked. It was early April. She knew it. Only weeks before Astrid Granville would marry Colin Poole. The first bride to marry at the manor. The first to die there. When the dance ended, 
Colin took Astrid's hand, brought it to his lips. It all froze. Astrid turned her head and looked at Sonia. We were so happy this night. A prelude, Colin said, to all the parties we would host, with friends, with family. We had everything ahead of us. I'm so sorry. Find the rings. You're the last who can. But I don't. Play, won't you, Astrid? Of course. The six dancers stood in their two lines. Colin stood at Astrid's shoulder. She played the same song exactly as before. Everything moved exactly as before. The old woman plied her needle and tapped her foot. The old man smiled and sipped his whiskey. Colin turned the page while the dancers wove. In the grate, a log fell with a shower of embers. And Sonia woke standing beside the bed. The dog slept on, so she hadn't disturbed him. She moved quietly out of the room, down the stairs, into the parlor. The furniture stood exactly as it should. Then again, she thought, it hadn't been the same furniture in the dream, or experience. No fire burned, no candles flickered, no oil lamps glowed. She wandered the room, but the only scent she caught came from the Asiatic lilies she'd bought the day before. At the piano, she ran her finger lightly over the keys. Then she walked into the foyer, looked up at Astrid's portrait. I heard you. I don't know what it means or what to do about it, but I heard you. But the house, and whatever walked in it, stayed silent. In the silence, she walked back upstairs. In bed, she closed her eyes and waited for sleep. Chapter 18 In the morning, she documented every detail she could remember. Afterward, she held herself to half a day of work. In her mind, to more or less make up for the time she'd taken for personal things during the work week. She put an extra hour in compiling a list of invisible companions. Considering her experience the night before, she included Astrid as the second bride to have seen her, spoken to her. That left her free to handle the few domestic chores her invisible housekeeper left for her. Since the sun beamed, and with weekly laundry in the machine, she took a long walk with Yoda. The thinning blanket of snow lured her and the dog to the edge of the woods. Then, a few steps in, she couldn't deny the wonder of it, the mystery of bare-branched trees, the deep green of pine. The light wind stirred pine needles to a kind of rustling, and from deeper in, came the sounds of chirping and chittering. Yoda scented the air just as she did, but the snow lay thicker there where the sun didn't quite reach. And she was reasonably sure she saw hoof prints or paw prints or some sort of animal tracks. While she'd enjoy crossing paths with a deer, getting a closer look, she doubted she'd enjoy crossing paths with anything less benign. They'd just leave the woods for now, to whatever wildlife wandered there. I'm a city girl, Yoda, and that's a fact. Instead, they walked back to stand at the seawall. Now the wind stirred through her hair and blew cool across her cheeks. With it came the fresh, adventurous scent of the sea. And under the clear sky, the sea held boldly blue to the horizon. Waves crashed below, and out on that plate of blue, boats glided. To her delight, she spotted her second whale, even picked up Yoda hoping he'd share the thrill. But he only wagged and licked her chin. This is it, doggy, she murmured. This is it for me. Times like last night, I get a little shaky. But this is it. Water and woods and whales. Who knew? When she took the dog back in, she swore she caught the scent of fresh orange oil. She keeps busy, Sonia muttered and hung up her coat. Very busy, Sonia decided, when she found her delicates hanging on the rod in the laundry room. A check of the dryer showed it empty, so she had no doubt she'd find what she'd tossed in it, folded and put away. Just as she'd found the dishwasher empty, and the dishes all put away when she checked that morning. How would it feel, she wondered, to spend your afterlife, if that's what it was, cleaning up after someone else? 
however ridiculous she found it. She took a long breath. Thank you very much. Please don't feel obliged. The iPad played Kid Rock's God Bless Saturday. Okay, fine. She couldn't stop the laugh. Message received. Clear skies gave way to thick, heavy clouds, and a solid six inches of snow fell overnight. Sonia took it as an excuse to indulge in a lazy afternoon. She took John D. coffee, added a generous slice of pound cake. Then she snuggled in for the day. Games of tug with the dog entertained both of them. Cuddled on the sofa on the second level of the library, she streamed whatever appealed. She FaceTimed her mother, then Cleo. She watched the dog romp through the fresh snow. As normal a weekend, she supposed, as she could ask for. To cap it off, she and Yoda settled down by the library fire, he with a chew bone and Sonia with the book Trey had recommended. He wasn't wrong in that plug, as she gobbled half of it down in one sitting. She walked the dog under a pure white globe of moon that shed pale blue light on the new snow and felt perfectly content and absolutely home. 1892. I look like a queen. No princess am I, as I am a woman grown. My lover, my groom, my husband is a man of stature. As I stand in the chapel for all to witness our union, I stand proud. I stand regal in a gown by worth. I would accept no less than the best on this day. I am blessed with an hourglass figure, and it is displayed to perfection in the heavy white satin with its long, lovely train. Its fluidity enhances my waist, a waist so small, Owen can span it with his hands. And he has. The bodice of lace clings to my breasts and is layered with sheer gossamer to a deceptively modest high neck. I have eschewed the popular leg of mutton sleeves, far from flattering on me, for slimmer and ruched. My veil, precisely the length of my train, is topped with a diamond tiara I know sparkles in the light streaming through the windows of the chapel. Under it, my hair, black as a raven's wing, has been styled in a smooth, high gibson. It suits very well, I'm told, my face and features, to which I added, discreetly, a bit of rouge on my cheeks and lips. Owen has my hand as we take our vows. He is the most handsome of men in his high, starched collar and formal morning coat. His eyes, so deep and green, smile into mine as he slips the ring on my finger. The gold band with its five diamonds he had designed for me by Cartier. The vow, the kiss, soft, sweet, though we have shared more passionate kisses in private. And we are wed. I have become Agatha Windward Pool, Mrs. Owen Pool. We are the pools of Pools Bay. And I know as we walk from the chapel, as people cheer and throw their rice, we make a fine match. We hold the same rung on the social strata and come to each other with respected family names and fortunes. Our looks complement each other's, so I expect to give him handsome sons and lovely daughters. We will travel, this I have insisted upon. While we will make our home in the manor above the sea, we will not be chained to it. A pied -a in New York will be essential to taking and holding our place in that society. We will, of course, make a crossing to Europe for our honeymoon, where we will spend three months at the best hotels in Paris and Rome and London. I will be the wife he needs, as he is the husband I deserve. People of the village tip their hats, their caps, toss flowers as the carriage rides through. Owen, a generous man, tosses coins to those who line the roads. I will also be generous. I lift my hand to acknowledge those who toil on the sea, in the fields, in the shops and cafes. And, of course, those who work for my husband and his family. We will make a generous donation to the school in Pools Bay to commemorate our wedding. But today is a day of feasting and celebration. Though I could not include Jane, my husband's twin, in my wedding party, as she is heavy with her fourth child, and I find her so very dull and ordinary, I embrace her when we arrive at the manor. 
We are sisters now, after all. Of course, the servants are well prepared and serve our guests champagne. Soon there will be dancing in the ballroom. We will have music and wine, food presented from the menu I prepared. The manor is filled with flowers I selected and approved. I am filled with joy as I embrace my dear mother, kiss my dear father. All is a glorious blur. I sweep up the grand staircase on the arm of my husband. There is food beautifully presented in the dining room for those who grow peckish from dancing. I have arranged for two small buffets near the ballroom as well. And wine, champagne, music. I dance with my husband, with my father, and with my father by marriage, my brothers, with cousins, with friends. We are lively on this day, and I drink champagne. Because my husband asks it of me, and I am dutiful, I sit a while with dull Jane. She speaks of her children, of course, as if the world revolves around them on this day, my day. Someone brings me a plate, so considerate. I nibble a bit and find the cook and kitchen staff have outdone themselves. I know I am radiant as I watch couples waltz and see Owen, a kind man, take his niece, barely seven, around the floor. Something sticks in my throat, and I reach for my glass. I am suddenly short of breath, dizzy. Too much champagne, I think. But now my throat is closed. I can draw no air. My heart, my heart is palpitating. I cannot breathe. The plate slips to the floor, and so do I. I am flushed with heat, fighting for breath as the world spins. I hear voices. Who are they? Who are they? I see Owen. Am I in his arms? I cannot speak. I would reach for him, but my arms are so weak. I know fear, such terrible fear that clings to me as I die in my worth gown on the ballroom floor. I seem to be standing aside, watching and fearing as Owen holds me. I see the woman in black walk in. Why don't they see her? I would call out, but I have no voice. She takes the ring from my finger, the beautiful wedding ring designed only for me. She puts it on her finger where she wears three others. She looks at me and I am so afraid. She looks at me and smiles a terrible smile. And I am more afraid still. Then she is gone as I am. Sonia spent the early part of her work week, ignoring the occasional bangs and slams, the bell ringing when she pushed herself down to the gym. She sent proposals off to the Doyles and to the florist and made what she considered solid headway on the caterer's project. Midweek, she took a call from her old boss. I waited until noon, Lane told her, hoping I'd catch you on a lunch break. Lunch was usually half a sandwich or some cheese on crackers, maybe an orange at her desk. It's good to hear from you, Lane. How are you doing, Sonia? Really well, thanks. Her iPad blasted out, R-O-C-K in the USA. She swiped it off. How are you? How's Matt and everyone? We're good. Situation normal. So, you know, controlled chaos. Sonia, we got a call from Bert Springer, Ryder Sports. I remember Bert, sure. Ryder's opening another branch in Portland, Maine. They'll still have their three Boston stores, including their flagship. Puzzled why Lane would contact her about an account, Sonia answered cautiously. Business must be good. Must be. They want to refresh everything with a major campaign. It's a big expansion for them. Keep the logo, but with an update. Bert asked for you specifically. Oh. Torn between pleasure and regret, Sonia reached for her Coke. That's flattering. You did good work for Ryder, and Bert knows it. I had a team. You did, and I'm going to be honest. I told him you were no longer with us, and we could certainly handle the project. I also gave him your contact information. Matt agreed with me on that. After the quick jolt, she struggled to keep her voice even. That's more than generous of you, both of you. Fair's fair. He'll certainly contact you. 
In the meantime, we're going to work up a proposal and presentation. Of course. We're fond of you, Sonia, so I'm going to tell you, take the shot only if you're sure you can hit the target. That's damn good advice, and I'm going to take it. When she hung up, she drank some Coke and tried to think. She got up and paced, and tried to think as Yoda took that to mean time for a walk outside. She took him out, let him do what he had to do, let him romp through the snow, and thought. She could hit the target if she got the shot. Yes, she'd had a team working on the designs. The signs, the ads, the beefed up webpage, on all of it. But she'd headed that team. And an update, a refresh wasn't an overhaul like Burton Riders had wanted for, no, five. Five years ago. Nearly six, she remembered. The first time she'd headed a team on a major project. She was better now, she told herself. Yeah, damn right. If she got the opportunity, she'd take the shot. She started to call the dog, then heard someone coming up the road and recognized Trey's truck when he rounded the last turn. Surprise. Of course, she wasn't wearing makeup. When would she learn? Anne had tossed an old jacket over older sweats. He looked so damn perfect when he pulled up, got out. Leather jacket instead of a parka, as the temperature had inched up a bit. Jeans, boots, sweater. His hair just the right amount of windblown. He'd smell good, too, she thought. He always did. Like, easygoing man. Nothing specific, nothing overt. Just, well, hmm. Looks like I didn't interrupt after all. No, we're just on our afternoon walk. No Mookie? He's with Owen and Jones. I had to go by there. Business. And he ditched me. He bent down to rub Yoda into delirium. Next time. I'm on my way to meet another client. Had a couple minutes. Come on in. No, really, a couple minutes. As he rubbed the dog, he frowned up at her. Is everything okay? Did something happen? You look a little stressed. No makeup. Old sweats. Gorgeous guy she'd really like to sink her teeth into. Potential big, big job. No, no. Well, a work thing. Possible work thing. Oh, yeah, I did meet Astrid the other night. Met? Astrid. The Astrid from the portrait. I really think so, yes. I want to hear about that, and have to figure it'll take more than the two minutes I've got right now. If you don't have plans later, why don't I come back? I can pick up a pizza. I... sure... Why did he have those eyes, she wondered, those glorious blue eyes. If you don't have any plans. Now I do. He straightened. Give me your toppings. Dealer's choice, except for anchovies. That's a firm no. Mushrooms are okay if you must. Got it. And I've about eaten up my two minutes. I wanted to come by in person to tell you. You're hired. Yes! In triumph, she gave his chest a light tap with her fist. You're not making a mistake. That's unanimous. You even got the nod from Sadie, and she's tough. I've got to go. I should be able to get back with the dog by 6, 6.30 if that's not too early. You're bringing pizza. There's no too early or too late. If you have another half a minute, can I ask if you think Bree would give me a recipe for something nice but easy? I'm bringing pizza. Not for you, for my mother. She'll be here early Friday evening. I don't want to do takeout after she's worked most of the day and driven up from Boston. I've never asked Brie for a recipe, so I can't say for sure. But you should give it a shot. She was going to take that shot, too, and pulled out her phone. Can you text her? Give her my number? If she's willing, she could text me. Remind her she likes me. No problem. See you tonight which, she thought as he drove off, for her own purposes, she'd consider a date. But now his firm's a client, so no taking a shot there unless I'm absolutely positively sure. Back to work, Yoda, so I can close it down in time to make myself presentable. Casually appealing, she added as they started toward the house. That's the goal. 
she planned to knock off at five sharp. But she got the go-ahead for the florist job, then had a long conversation with Bert Springer. Grateful the conversation wasn't via Zoom, so he couldn't see the nerves, she took detailed notes. In the end, she'd agreed to work up a proposal and presentation. When she hung up, she sat very still. I can't blow this. What if I blow this? I can't blow it. Her iPad played the Rocky theme and broke her panic with a laugh. Okay, it's okay. I've got ideas. I just have to pick the right one and make it shine. And, oh shit, it's almost 5.30. Shit, shit, shit. She shut down, then dashed over to her bedroom. The red dress lay on the bed. No, no, no. It's pizza in the kitchen. Face first. She raced into the bathroom, took a breath. Not too much. Just a little this, a little that. Not too much still took time, especially since she couldn't decide on a happy dance or dropping her head between her knees. She had three new projects, and one was a whopper. She still had one to finish, a client to satisfy. So we're rolling. We're busy, productive, and very, very nervous. When she walked back into the bedroom, the red dress had been replaced by stone gray jeans and a red sweater. Okay, that's a very nice choice. We'll go with it because I don't have time to think about it. She changed, decided her wardrobe assistant had made the perfect choice. As she tossed the sweats in the hamper, Yoda let out a bark and tore out of the room. The doorbell rang. Okay, here we go. Yoda danced at the door, and when she opened it, the dogs immediately greeted each other with canine joy. A man, a dog, and a pizza. Jackpot. You have to pay for it with a ghost story. No lack of those around here. Let me take your jacket. I've got it. He handed her the pizza before heading to the closet. From the library, the iPad played, Welcome to the Party. They never quit. Come on, boys and man. From what I've heard, your DJ has eclectic tastes. They lean toward rock or pop, spanning eras, and... Sonia glanced back as they walked toward the kitchen. They're quick. How did things go with the client? Outside of privilege, I can say good enough. I'm also going to say that alone, he pointed a finger up, would send a lot of people heading back to Boston. I like music. After setting the pizza box on the counter, she peeked inside. Pepperoni and black olives. I hear that's your go-to. No secrets in Pools Bay. Oh, more than a few. I guess a lawyer would know. Want a beer? Thanks. His brow lifted when she pulled one out of the fridge. Sam Adams. I hear that's your off-tap go-to. So it is. Bottle's fine, I don't need a glass. She handed him the bottle and wine for herself. Has Mookie eaten? I picked him up too early for him to mooch off Jones. Then he can mooch off Yoda. She fed a couple of hungry dogs, got plates before they settled at the small table. Trey slid a slice on each plate before tapping his bottle to her glass. Did you get a chance to text Bree? I did, and she grilled me some. Food allergies and all that. I just said you didn't mention any. She wanted your skill level. Did you tell her nil? With that slow smile, he shook his head. Sorry, cutie. The pot roast ruined you there. That was a one-off. I hope not. Anyway, she said she'd send you something. She's tight with her mom, so you got points for wanting to make dinner for yours. Sonia's eyes laughed over a bite of pizza. And Manny? Is she tight there, too, by now? Don't know, didn't ask. Don't really want to think about it. Pay up. He gestured with his beer. Astrid. Astrid. I think I went through the mirror again. The mirror from your father's sketches. She nodded, drank some wine. I don't remember that part, but it felt like it, which is impossible to explain. You don't have to. I don't know if it was a dream or real, but it felt real. I was in the front parlor, she began and told him. I woke up, or whatever I did, standing by the bed again. But Yoda was still sleeping. Maybe because it wasn't scary this time. Or not scary and tragic like seeing Marianne Poole die. 
but she saw me, Trey. And she looked at me, spoke to me. No one else in the room did. I think she's the piano player. She doesn't play in the parlor now. And I'm wondering if it's because she's sad. And that night, the night I saw, everyone was happy. You didn't call me, he pointed out. It wasn't scary. Not like before. I admit, I'd actually feel better about it if I thought I'm hallucinating, but I'm not. I can go through the house, try to find the mirror. I don't think you'd find it. I honestly don't think anyone will until it's ready to be found. You're ascribing a will to a mirror. She put a second slice on each plate. And that's the strangest thing about all this? Got me there. I've thought about it. A lot. I think these... I'm calling them dreams. Are a positive. I'm seeing and hearing and learning. Not just names and pictures in a book. And it's not like a movie. Because I'm in it somehow. Like... I step into that time, that moment. Brows lifted. He studied her face. You're adding time travel to hauntings. At that, she could only shrug. And if I'd thought or said any of this a year ago, I'd have raced to the nearest shrink. You're about as stable as they come, Trey said half to himself. So I always thought. I always found Cleo's crystals and white sage and her easy acceptance of... Let's say woo-woo, just charming and harmless. Now I'm going to be particularly glad when she's living here and has that viewpoint. How soon? She hopes another week or so. She had a yard sale at my mom's over the weekend and told me she sold a lot. She's packing up some things, and my mom will bring what she can. And she's already got someone who'll take over the apartment. Bad breakup. The thing is, I'm not afraid here. He looked her in the eye. Ever? All right, there are times. The Marianne dream, the business with the gold room, the banging and the blizzard that wasn't. But now I have Yoda. At his name, Yoda pranced over. Mookie followed. That's right, I've got you and you too when you're around. She rubbed both dogs. And I should let them out. I've got it. Are you trusting him on his own? I've let him out a couple times, watched him like a hawk. He stays close. And he'll stick with the mook. He doesn't wander off. Trey opened the door, but watched while the dogs played in the snow. Yoda sees them. Or someone I don't, now and then. Trey glanced back at her. Mookie did whenever I brought him over to see Cullen. Jones, too. You said you saw a woman on the widow's walk. A woman in white. I didn't believe you then. I do now. It wasn't Astrid. She was blonde, and the woman I saw had dark hair. I couldn't really see her face. My father says I used to babble at ghosts when I came here as a toddler. I don't really remember. Because she hoped he'd linger, she topped off her wine, got him another beer. Anything else? I was five. I know that because I'd just started kindergarten. I remember, it's a little blurry, but I remember seeing this guy in Colin's office, wearing a tux. I knew it was a tuxedo because Owen, well, his parents, had a dog, and his markings looked like a tuxedo. It's why they called him Tux. Anyway, he was sitting there with a glass in one hand and a fat cigar in the other. I could smell the cigar smoke. He blew smoke rings and laughed. Young Oliver, he called me. He said I was a good boy for visiting a lonely man, and to watch out for the witch or she'd gobble me up. He glanced back. I said that witches were for Halloween, and he said, not around here. I mostly remember because that one sent me running back to my father to tell him, and that's how the story goes. Did they check it out? Apparently, I wouldn't have it otherwise, but no one was in there. I'm going to let the dogs in the mudroom. Got an old towel? There's one in there. She rose to go with him, grabbed a second towel so they dried off the snow-coated dogs together. Kids and dogs, then, I guess. I guess. One other time. And this I do remember. He straightened to lay the towel over the rod. 
I was about 12, and just taking up the guitar. Dad and Colin were in the game room, the one just beyond the library, playing chess. I didn't then, nor do I now, have any interest in chess. He left the chess table in pieces to your father. Yeah, he did. The dogs followed her back into the kitchen, where she got them both treats. I was bored, so I went down to the music room. Colin told me I could practice on the guitar in there anytime. I knew how to strum a few songs. Didn't have any fingering down, but I could strum a couple. He picked up the beer. So I'm working on it, trying to play Tom Petty's Free Fallen. An oldie, but Tom Petty and the chords are pretty basic. I tell myself I'm jamming it. And I look up, and there she is. Really hot, babe. He took a swig of beer. My 12-year-old system's a lot more jolted by really hot babe standing there, smiling at me, than where the hell did she come from? Did you recognize her? Not then. He shook his head. Long blonde hair, waterfall long and straight. She's wearing these jeans that ride low and tight on the hips and flare out below the knees. And this little white top, short enough that I can see, holy shit, skin. He grinned as he waved a hand in front of his stomach. It's got these flowers, like, embroidered up here, where it rides pretty low again, so, oh my God, boobs are happening right under there. She's got beads, lots of them, hanging where I'm trying not to look. Pale pink lips, eyes that have all that stuff, liner and all that, thick, cat-like, so they just sing a song to a boy's libido. That's a lot of detail you've remembered on this one. It imprinted on my brain and my balls in that moment. My man, she said. And I might have drooled a little. You can handle that axe. At 12, I didn't know axe meant guitar, so I think I said, huh? And she told me Petty was great, but to try learning satisfaction, because the stones were gods. Then she shot me the peace sign, and she tapped those two fingers on those pale pink lips and blew me a kiss that left me a quivering puddle of hormones. He lifted his beer in toast. And she was gone. That's some story. I never saw her again, and Owen and I both looked. That is, until I saw her picture in Colin's book. I had my first real crush over the ghost of Lillian Crest, who called herself Clover. That struck Sonia like a lightning bolt. My father's birth mother? Don't hold it against me. I saw a hot babe, and she'd have been about 18. Actually, except for the pale pink, you've got her mouth. Oh. Instinctively, she pressed her fingers to it. That's so strange to hear. It's a really nice mouth. So those are my experiences with the haunted and haunting that I remember. But did you learn to play Satisfaction? Oh, yeah. I like to think she heard me when I whacked away at it in the music room. I'm not a music history buff, but I don't think Tom Petty was around, professionally, in the 60s. No, he didn't hit until... With a frown, Trey trailed off. No, why didn't that come home to me before? Twelve-year-old hormones. Impossible, Sonia admitted, to ignore the fact that the man who currently had her hormones humming had once crushed on her biological grandmother. In spirit, she supposed. She kept up somehow. Must have. Colin liked music. You saw his vinyl collection. And with a second lightning bolt, Sonia raised a hand. Trey, maybe she's the DJ. Having that same thought. On the counter, Sonia's phone played Abba's that's me. Holy crap. She grabbed her wine, took a gulp. Give me a second, because this is good. Unsettling for a minute, but good. That's your biological grandmother. Okay, back to unsettling. But it's good. We have an identity, and that has to be positive. I'm not calling her grandma. I mean, when you think about it one way, she's younger than I am. I wonder if Colin ever met his mother. I don't think he ever mentioned that to my father. I didn't tell my dad or Colin. I told Owen because, hot babe. Is it 
odd that I'm going to feel easier knowing who she is? I think it would be odd if you didn't. She isn't trying to scare you. She wasn't trying to scare me. She was, and is, making a connection. She died here, and it hurt Sonia's heart to think of it. She had to be afraid, in pain. But she plays music for me. I got a chance to bid on a major account today, and she played happy music for me. What major account? Oh, distracted, she pushed a hand at her hair. Do you know Ryder Sports? Sure, based in Boston. I bought plenty of their stuff online. She smiled. What did you think of their website? Sucks you in, easy to navigate, your work. I headed the team that designed it. They're expanding, putting a store in Portland and want to update. I'm going to be competing for the job against my old company, which is, let's go back to unsettling. Not for long. He said it so matter-of-factly, he gave her a boost she hadn't known she needed. You're confident in your work for a reason. They're a strong, innovative company. But I've got the chance, and I'm taking it. And as you're a client, I'll say this in no way means I won't give your firm exactly what it needs and wants. Never doubted it. And speaking of clients, I've got a little work to do for the one I saw before I got here. We've still got pizza. No breakfast tops the breakfast of cold pizza. On that, we agree. We'll split it. Chapter 19 It would help, Sonia thought as she took two slices for a plate, if she didn't like him so much. His looks, his manner, that easy way. She wasn't a puddle of hormones, but she could definitely feel them pulsing whenever he came around. It was either get over it or make that move and see. A casual goodnight kiss at the door, she decided, and she'd know if they equaled hangout buddies or had the potential for more. He reached for the pizza box just as she turned. Bodies bumped for one humming second, eyes locked. Sorry. He took a full step back. No casual kiss at the door then. But... Are you sorry because you are or because you think you should be? If it's the first, I'll stop wondering. If it's the second, I'd like to know why. I'm sorry, I think I should be. All right, sort of, but that doesn't answer the why. First off, the firm represents Colin's estate. Your father represents the estate and my interests. We're a family firm. Okay, but I kind of looked it up. The faintest hint of a smile came into his eyes, then curved his lips. Did you? I thought it might possibly become an issue. My take is, I'm not actually your client. And even if I were, you'd continue to represent me competently. And at your father's advice... I hired a lawyer in Boston. I'm not going to date him. Good policy. Especially since he's my mother's boss. But you said first off, if you're not attracted that way, then... You're not a stupid woman by any measure. But that's the beginning of a very stupid statement. He slid his hands into his pockets. The way I see it, you've had a lot of major upheaval in less than a year. You called off your wedding. That's right. I think that's the sensible thing to do when finding your fiancé in bed with your cousin, don't you? Sensible doesn't mean you weren't hurt. I was pissed, shocked, and that still grates because it makes me a fool. And pissed, which is better. But I'm a little ashamed to admit I wasn't as hurt as I should have been as I would have been if I'd loved him the way I thought I did, the way I should have loved a man I was going to marry. But he wasn't the man I thought he was, and that makes me a fool. You're not. Fire snapped into her eyes as she jabbed a finger at him and stopped him cold. I knew something wasn't right. I knew it, but I kept telling myself it was wedding jitters. 
I don't generally get jitters, but, well, I never planned a wedding before. And he wanted exactly the opposite of what I did. I wanted lovely and intimate and romantic, and he insisted on... She waved her arms in the air. Big, fancy ballroom in the big, fancy hotel with a few hundred of our not-so-close friends, top shelf, open bar, and on and on. We looked at houses, and I wanted something like this. Not this scale, but I wanted a house with history and character, which is why this place had me at first sight. And he wanted sleek, modern, new, important neighborhood. I kept giving in, which isn't like me either. Why did I keep giving in? Because I'd said yes, and I thought I loved him. Fuck. After grabbing her wine glass, she circled the kitchen while he stood and watched her, while both dogs sat and watched her. I'm shelling out ridiculous amounts of money for deposits because I'd said yes, because it felt like we had more in common than not, and the sex was fine. So don't tell me I'm not stupid. Don't tell me I wasn't a fool when I was. On the day, the very day I walked in on him and Tracy, I canceled an appointment with the breathtakingly expensive florist because I just couldn't take it. I needed a break, all the while telling myself it was just wedding jitters. She glugged some wine. My ass! And there they were, their clothes scattered along the way to the bedroom. And if I had loved him, it shut off just like that. She snapped her fingers. All I felt was pissed off and disgusted. I kicked them both out of my house, both of them mostly naked. That was satisfying. She drank more wine. With him claiming it didn't mean anything. She came on to him, he just slipped. And that was it for me. But he wouldn't leave it alone. He went to our bosses and strung them some bullshit about me having a little breakdown when I had no intention of telling them what he'd done. But he's going to lay it all out on me? Just hell no. So I told them. And we thought we'd worked it out. I loved working there. And they'd see to it we didn't work on the same projects. He obviously didn't love me, so he'd get over it. And we'd both move on. But no. He found little ways to get under my skin. And I ignored it. Then he found bigger ways. He keyed my car. He let the air out of my tires, so I had to call an Uber at midnight. Midnight? Because he'd sabotaged my work. Just wiped my work off my computer, my backup. So I had to stay late and put it back together. I couldn't prove it, but come on, who else? They couldn't fire him. No proven cause. So I had to quit. She jabbed a finger at Trey. You're not rebound guy because I'm not rebounding. And that was a lot. Wow, <laughs> I'm still pissed. Done? Yeah, sorry. More than a little appalled at herself, she dragged a hand through her hair. That was way beyond where I meant to go. We're going to back up a little. He picked up the second beer he'd only half finished. Why did you pay the deposits? He was going to pay part of the balance, and for the honeymoon mostly. Traditionally, the bride's family pays. Because I'm an idiot. Stop it, you're not. He didn't jab a finger at her, not his style, but held up a hand and just as effectively cut off her response. He manipulated you, and it sounds like he's damn good at it. I suppose. I got some of it back, more than I expected, largely due to Cleo. She took some of it on, and she's got this way of talking and talking, all calm and reasonable. As it hit her, she took a slow sip of wine. A lot like you. Good. Now let's talk about him keying your car, giving you flat tires. Did you file a report? Yeah. What were the cops going to do? Nobody saw him. What could the bosses do? And if they'd fired him, I think it would have made it worse. I did what was right for me and found out I like working freelance. I like being in charge of, well, all of it. Has he bothered you since? Not really. Then I moved here. And this is the most I've thought of him since I have. I want to know if he does. She frowned at him. You're mad, she realized. It hardly shows, but it does a little. 
Of course I'm mad. We'll put aside him screwing your cousin. That's just the move of an asshole who thinks cheating's no big deal. He manipulated you into pumping out money for something you didn't want. And if you hadn't caught him, you'd very likely be living in some slick house you didn't want. That would have been your mistake. She opened her mouth, then shut it again. Because truth was truth. Her mistake. He set the beer down again. But the rest is vindictive, mean, petty, criminal, and dangerous. So yeah, I'm mad. And I want to know if he comes at you in any way again. All right. The fact she could see the mad not only calmed her, but gave her another boost she hadn't known she'd needed. Will you punch him in the face? That's always satisfying in the moment. But you can prolong the moment by maneuvering him into doing the punching in front of witnesses. Then he's got an assault charge to deal with. I bet you could do it, too. She let out a breath. Now, the whole point of that unhinged rant was to say yes. I had an upheaval, but it unleashed rage, pretty obviously, and didn't leave me with a broken heart, weeping into my caramel ice cream while watching sad movies. You made your case there. I figured you'd quit your job because it was too awkward to work in the same office. So, moving from there, you still have upheavals. Learning your father had a twin, Collins will, packing up your life in Boston to come here. Add what you're dealing with here. I love this place. It surprises me how much. Still, I understand you might not want to get involved, on a personal level, with a woman who goes on an unhinged rant about a man she broke things off with months ago. You didn't. I didn't? You went on a rant about a situation and your reaction and responses to it. Which, in my opinion, you're taking too much of the blame for. But you'll get over that. I will? Because you're really not stupid, Sonia. But he did hurt you. Even if it was only your pride, your ego, your sense of trust. He hurt you. Cleo said about the same. Maybe I should try to fix you up with Cleo. I like her, but I'm interested in someone else. After all that, more after all that, actually. He took a step toward her. The phone jammed out with, let's do it tonight. When she laughed, he drew her in, slow, in a kind of glide that had her heart bounding into her throat, then dropping down to her toes. He watched her as his hands slid from her shoulders, down her arms, watched her as he eased her with just a fraction closer, Watched still as his lips brushed hers, just brushed. She lost her sense of time and place as he took the kiss deep, slow, sumptuously slow and deep. Her knees didn't go weak. She thought they might have dissolved, but the hands on her hips kept her upright as his mouth woke every nerve in her body. Oh, well, she managed. I was hoping that would work. I'm good with taking things slow, if you want some time. I really don't. With a hand at the back of his neck, she drew him down to her again. If we keep this going, we'll end up on the kitchen floor. He nipped his teeth at the side of her throat and sent those awakened nerves snapping. And the dogs will be all over us. I can let them out or we go upstairs. I vote for bed. Wanting him. Wanting her hands on him, she tugged him from the room. It's a really nice bed. The dogs can share Yoda's. He stopped, twice, driving her a little more crazy each time. The dogs trotted up ahead of them. You said sex with the dickhead was fine. I did? Yes. Do you want to retract or amend that statement? I can wish I hadn't said it. But no, it's accurate. He circled her into the bedroom. I can do better than fine. You already are. I might be a little rusty, but I'm pretty sure it's all going to come back to me. Linking her arms around his neck, she pressed her body to his. It already is. In the flickering light of the fire, the low light of the lamp, he ran his hands under her sweater, up her back, 
He took his time learning the body he'd imagined far too often over the last weeks. Something about her. Something. Now, she hummed low in her throat as his hands roamed. Now he felt her skin warm under the trail of his fingers. Nice sweater. She quivered just a little as he drew it up and off. Yours too. Easing it up his body, she sighed. His hands moved, a sort of glide up her back, down again. We should sit down a minute. Sit down? And take off her shoes. Oh, right. They sat, hip to hip on the side of the bed. A little rusty, she said. Not from where I'm sitting. She tossed back her hair. Maybe a little nervous. We'll take care of that. And sitting hip to hip, he cupped her face in his hands and kissed her. Need smothered nerves. As she shifted to him, everything took on such focus, such clarity. The feel of his skin against hers, the taste of that wonderfully lazy mouth, the big, hard-palmed hands on her face, the scent of flowers and him. The smooth, crisp sheets when he laid her back made an arousing contrast with the weight of his body on hers. He never broke the kiss, but took it deeper. Slow, 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 while his hands began to move again. Under those hands, her heartbeat thickened. Under those hands, she luxuriated in being touched and used her own. Lean muscle, hard planes, strong shoulders. So long, she thought, since she'd explored a man's body, felt him respond to her touch. Testing now, both of them, gauging those responses. What do you like? What moves you? What excites you? When he released the hook of her bra, her pulse hammered, anticipation spilled through her like wine. When his mouth took her breast, she arched, urging him to take more. Arching again, her hands fisted in his hair, she demanded more. When he gave and he took, she tugged at his belt. Everything in her shot to urgent. He murmured something as he slid her jeans down her hips, but she couldn't hear through the pounding of her own heart. When, she wondered, had the ache of need burned into fire? Slow, he'd thought. This time, this first time. But she trembled, and heat pumped off her skin. Murmuring still, his lips pressed to her throat where her pulse hammered. He cupped her. At the press of his hand to her center, she broke in one long, hard wave. Her body rose to his, shuddered, then fell. The hand she'd clutched at his shoulder slid away. He might have soothed, might have tossed control aside and devoured. Before he could do either, she rolled and took him over. First his mouth in a wild, greedy kiss that shot into his system like a live wire. Then his body as she straddled him and took him in, took him deep. He saw Sonia in the firelight, moving over him, her skin glowing, her arms lifted as she rode another wave. Then she took his hands, pressed them to her breasts. Even the thought of control snapped. He rode the next wave with her. Soft, sated, satisfied, she melted down to him. She wondered if her sigh sounded like a prayer of gratitude. As he stroked his hand down her hair, over her back, she sighed again. Better than fine. Like... She managed to lift an arm in the air. Up there better than fine. Glad to hear it. She felt his lips curve against the side of her throat. I plan to take it slower. She raised her head, pushed back her hair as she looked down at him. Was I too fierce for you? Just fierce enough. But I missed a few spots. He trailed a finger down her cheek. I'll catch them next time. She lowered her forehead to his. I need to tell you something. If you can't tell me something when we're naked in bed after sex, when? It's actually about getting naked in bed after sex. My personal rule is a minimum of four dates before I get to that event. 
four because threes become a cliched general rule, and I don't like to follow cliches. Or general rules? Actually, I'm fairly reasonable about general rules. So, you broke your personal one with me. Flattering. Not exactly. See, I decided to consider the day you and Owen moved the furniture and stayed for dinner a kind of date. Interesting. Lazily, he twined her hair around his finger. I usually know when I'm on a date. Well, my scale. Then the whole gold room incident, followed by dinner at the lobster cage. I considered that date number two. That actually was a date. Then on that, our scales agree. After some debate and a lot of justification, I deemed the pot roast dinner a date, which makes three. It appears all our dates involve food. Dates so often do, right? And tonight, you brought pizza, so... Fourth date. You didn't break your rule for me. No. I just worked it out my way so it came out to four. So essentially, we've been dating for weeks. <laughs> Looks like I need to catch up. I'd say you have. She gave him a quick kiss, then sat up. You know, I didn't turn on the fire, light the candles on the mantel, or turn down the bed. Suddenly, she gripped his hand. And I just had a very disturbing thought. Do you think they, um, watch all the time? Like when we were celebrating our fourth date? His gaze shifted to the fire, the candles. That is a disturbing thought. More when you consider one of them is my biological grandmother. I'd rather not think about it. I'm not going to think about it. Let's give her, and them, the benefit of trusting they respect privacy. I can do that. I think I really need to do that. Since you can, and you will. He sat up, then tumbled her down again. Let's take care of those spots I missed. She didn't give ghostly voyeurs another thought, and he stayed. At three, the clock sounded and woke him. Beside him, Sonia stirred but didn't wake. He slipped out of bed, pulled on his jeans. Since both dogs watched him, tails thumping, he shook his head. Stay, he whispered it. Stay with Sonia. To be sure they did, he closed the door on his way out. There was a table clock in the front sitting room that chimed the hour, he remembered. But it chimed a soft, musical sound. That's not what he'd heard. The old grandfather clock, he thought. Second parlor. The one Colin never wound, so it wouldn't sound the hour because he'd found it annoying. Particularly at night. Sonia might have started winding it but that didn't explain why he hadn't heard it any other time since she'd moved in. He made his way downstairs into the room Colin had called the quiet place because of its position in the house. It had only one window, facing north. The sound of the sea or the wind through the pines didn't reach here. He turned on the light and studied the old clock with its carved cabinet and moon-faced dial. The brass pendulum hung still, and the room quiet as always, but the hands on that moon-faced dial stood at three. Had they always, he wondered? He couldn't remember, but he'd clearly heard the trio of bongs, slow-paced, almost funereal. As he walked to it, a wave of icy air hit him. He'd felt it before, in the gold room. So it's you, he murmured. Good to know. Next thing I'd like to know, why 3 a.m.? He heard piano music from the music room, stepped back. Midnight's supposed to be the witching hour, right? Yeah, I thought. He turned, expecting to see Sonia, and looked at her grandmother. Man, all right. His heart gave two hard beats before it settled again. It's you. 
I saw you once before. Sure, you were such a cute little guy. You had good hands on that guitar. You grew up. Yeah, you never got that chance. Did you make the clock chime? Not me, baby. You're right, that's all that bitch. Every freaking night, bong, bong, bong. How come I can see you now? She smiled, a pretty teenager who'd never grow old. Because you're here, and she's here. Sonia, and you guys did the it. She shrugged. Cool with me, free love. I missed most of that. Things were just happening when I, you know, died. Bummer. But I loved Charlie. We really had it together. I'd have loved my babies. I'm sure you would have. We were going to live here, start a commune. Art, music, poetry. She did a little spin. Lots of spiritual stuff, too. But she lifted her shoulders, let them fall. I had a ring, too. I'm sorry. She lifted her left hand, tapped her ring finger with the other. That fucking witch took it. So you watch out for her, got it? Then that old bitch, Charlie's mom, she took care of the rest. He shouldn't have done what he did, kill himself like that. I mean, wow. I didn't have a choice, but he did. And that's how she got her hands on my babies, my little boys. I was pretty pissed at him for a while, but, well, shit, I love him. Is, is he here too? For a ghost, he thought. She had a smile like the summer sun. Well, yeah, what do you think? Lots of us here. It's the freaking curse. So that's it for now. You need to help, Sonia. It's so far out, I've got a granddaughter. I mean, far out. You need to help her get those rings back. She smiled again, sweet as spun sugar. You were real good to my boy. It's weird calling him a boy because he got to be an old man. Anyway, coming out like this really fries me after a while. You should go back to bed. Wait, I've got questions but she was gone, and the music left with her. Deliberately, he opened the glass cover on the face of the clock, moved the hands at random to 20 after four. He checked the music room anyway, then did a long circuit around the main floor and another on the second before he went back to Sonia's room. She slept still. Both dogs opened their eyes to watch him as he went back to the bed. He pulled off his jeans, slipped into bed with her. In sleep. She turned to him. Because she shivered, he drew her close. He woke in the morning to see her pulling on a sweatshirt. Early riser. Oh, she turned and laughed. Yeah, sorry. I thought I was quiet. You were. I have to be an early riser. I've got court this morning. Court? Do you really wear a tie with your flannel shirt or an actual suit? Yeah, an actual suit. It's court. I bet you look good in one. I'm going to let the dogs out. Make coffee. Right there, you've earned undying gratitude. I'll take it. There's spare toothbrushes in the bathroom. Either you guys stocked them or Colin had them. Help yourself. I will. Okay if I grab a shower? It'll save me time at home. It's all yours. Come on, boys. Let's go outside. The outside had them both scrambling up and out, with her hurrying after. She looked good in the morning, he thought. But then, to his eye, she always did. He thought it a shame he couldn't talk her into the shower with him. But besides court, he needed time to tell her about three in the morning. He could have spent a year in that shower and gave Colin full marks on it. When he dressed and walked downstairs, he found coffee waiting while she put pizza on plates. You want it warmed up? Why? He went for coffee first. That's what I say. 
What's wrong with us? I've got time to sit down here with it. Do you have time? Sure. She sat at the counter with him. When I go up, the bed'll be made as perfectly as in the best hotel. I've gotten over the oddness of that and appreciate the time saved. He jumped right in. Do you know the old grandfather clock in the second parlor? The second parlor is... Right, that one. With the big clock. I haven't really used that room. Have you wound the clock? No. I should do that? I hadn't thought about it. Don't. I'm conducting an experiment. Have you ever heard it bong? Because that's the word for it. On the hour. Once for one, twice for two, and so on. One bong on the half hour. No, I don't... Maybe. She frowned. Maybe. Three bongs at 3 a.m. I didn't dream that or imagine that. Not unless I did too. And I didn't. You slept through it last night. Colin never wound it either, because who wants to try to sleep with that thing going off every hour? It woke me up, so I went down to take a look. She took a moment, ate some pizza. I'm going to see your call me and raise it with a why didn't you wake me up? Maybe you just wound it, and it seemed wrong to wake you up at three in the morning to ask. If I'd wound it, we'd have heard it while we were eating, while we were having sex. That's the point. Blame three in the morning and fuzzy thinking. She took a moment for coffee while she studied him. You're probably good in court. That's what they pay me for. It wasn't wound, and the hands stood at three, on the dot. If you haven't used the room, you probably didn't notice where the clock stopped. No, but I'll pay attention now. I moved them, the experiment. Before I did, the piano music started. Barbara Allen. I was going to check, and when I turned around, hot babe. She nearly choked on breakfast pizza. You saw her? Lillian Crest? I'd say in the flesh, but that's not really accurate. He told her, recounting the conversation. Lots of them, Sonia repeated. I thought I'd accepted that, but I'd have to consider that confirmation. She had a ring. I thought she must have, since the number seven keeps coming up. But damn it, if she knows Hester Dobbs has them, why not tell you how to find them? How to get them back? Not in evidence. But it might be she. They just don't know. I'm stuck on the clock, on three. Okay, if I come back after work, I could pick up something for dinner. I'd like you to come back whether you pick up something or not. But that's a plus. How do you feel about Chinese? Fondly. Check the online menu at the China Kitchen and text me what you want. I've got to move. Judges dislike a lawyer who's late for court. I can drop Mookie at the office, or I can leave him with you. Oh, leave him. We'd love it. So will he. He cupped her face, kissed her before he got up. Unless you say no, I'm tossing a change of clothes in a bag before I come back. And staying. I'm not saying no. Good. I'll see you probably about six again, depending. Good luck in court. Alone, she rested her chin on her fist and thought just how much her life, her world, had changed. As part of the change, she got up to call in the dogs and give them breakfast.
Chapter 20 Since Yoda had company, she got a spare chew bone so both would have something to gnaw on while she worked. As they started up, her iPad greeted her with Adele's love song. It's lust and like at the moment, thanks Lillian. The music shifted almost instantly to Crimson and Clover. Okay then, Clover. The dogs took their bones by the crackling fire, one she hadn't started. I've got a knuckle down to work. I've got a job to finish, two to start, and a major proposal to get going. And my mother's coming for the weekend, so no making up time there. She pressed her fingers to her eyes, drew a deep breath, then booted up her computer. An hour in, and she would get the catering job to testing stage by midday. Her phone signaled a text, which reminded her she had to look up the menu and text Trey. She read the text from Brie. This scallop and pasta dish is quick, simple, and delish. If, listen up, if you don't overcook the pasta or the scallops. Got that? Pay attention. I got it, I got it. She scanned the recipe. It doesn't sound so simple. And you didn't need to use all caps on don't overcook reminders. It's intimidating. Your cook time's about 10 minutes, so don't start it until your mom's there and you're ready to eat. Sometime during the day, you're going to make some quick, easy beer bread. I am? Bread? Jesus, that's crazy. I'm not making bread. But she read the instructions. Okay, that actually does sound easy. I can do that. I assume you can make a salad. If not, text me, and after I get finished mocking and judging you, I'll send instructions. Finish off the meal with a raspberry sorbet. I could give you a recipe for that. Basic, but she'll buy this at the store so you don't feel overloaded. Bon appetit, Brie. It required another steadying breath. Thank you. My mom may collapse in shock, but thank you. I do know how to make a salad. It's a house specialty, so no mocking or judging required. I swear by all that's holy. I won't overcook because I sense the scope of your wrath. Much appreciated, Sonia. Bree signed off with an emoji of a smiley face wearing a chef's hat. Sonia set the phone aside. She'd take it when she went into the village to shop, and she wouldn't think about it until. By midday, the catering site was ready for testing, and the dogs ready for a walk. So she realized, was she? The dogs bounded through and wrestled in the snow. She thought, if she looked hard enough, she could see tiny patches of anemic grass on the south side of the house. The bounding and wrestling meant she had to mop both dogs up. They got a treat, and she got a Coke, a bowl of pretzels, and a tangerine. At nearly four, she surfaced. Cursed when testing showed her an error. After some adjustments, she ran it again. And something that had simmered in the back of her mind on the rider job popped out. That's good. That could be good. Bold, fun, movement. She got up got her tools, and started a fresh mood board. At her desk, she did some quick sketches just to give herself another visual. Caught up, she shifted back and forth between the testing and refining her vision, and jumped when a dog stood on either side of her wagging. Oh, God, it's almost six. I didn't mean to work this late. Sorry, boys, sorry. Let's shut it down and go. No saying the word yet. After she backed up everything, Shut down, she jogged downstairs with them. Since they dashed to the door, she went after them. She let them out, come back for a jacket. And opened the door, just as Trey started to ring the bell. Oh, they didn't bark. Mookie knows when it's me. I guess this one does now, too. He handed her a takeout bag before he gave the dogs attention. Hi, guys. Good day for you. I should have let them out again an hour ago, but I got involved. I just shut down. You're still wearing a suit. A deep, dark gray with a pale gray shirt and a maroon and navy tie. She all but felt her mouth water. You look good in a suit. I figured you would. Since the dogs ran out and rounded the house, she stepped back to let Trey in. I took a walk with them about noon, then I completely lost track of time. They're fine. You look a little dazed. Everything okay? Yes, the work, it just started rolling. This smells great. You made good choices. He hung up his coat, 
I try. It felt nice, just nice to walk with him back to the kitchen. Why don't you sit down? I'll pour you some wine. He kissed her, several levels up from a casual hello. You put in a long one. So did you, but I'll take the wine. How did court go? Since she'd gone for shrimp, he pulled a white out of the cooler. Divorce case, not pretty. The now officially ex-husband made a scene, an ugly one, right in the courtroom. I'll bet judges don't like that even more than lawyers who are late. You win that bet. After two warnings from the bench, he got cited for contempt. He's lucky it's just a fine because he was heading for a night in jail until his lawyer finally got him to shut the hell up. Okay if I grab a beer? You don't have to ask, Trey. Then I'll grab one and get the dog food. I picked up more food there. It's still in the truck. You didn't have to. I'm going to the store tomorrow. Cross that one off your list. Mookie eats more than Yoda. He dished out their food and straightened at the wolf at the door. Speaking of, I'll dry them off. Not in that suit you won't. She waved him back. Then I'll set the human food out. And nice again, she thought, to share Chinese food in the kitchen, to talk about normal things. I'd like to see the mood board and sketches on writer. Sure, it's just preliminary. She smiled when he loosened his tie and flipped open the top button of his shirt. And that's why women often like men in ties. Because they like to see them wearing a noose? No, because when they do what you just did, it's sexy. I don't know why, but it is. I've got to wear another one on Saturday. Wedding. A cousin in Kennebunkport. You've got your mother this weekend, or I'd talk you into going with me. Don't you already have a plus one? Shaking his head, he speared one of the shrimp off her plate. Wedding dates are dicey. Then you've got your great aunt Marilyn giving your plus one a significant look, telling you what a lovely couple you make before she beams and says, when are we going to dance at your wedding, Trey? Shaking his head, he went back to his mooshu pork. Once a single guy hits 30, you spend half your time at a family wedding dodging the when's your turn question. For women, that comes once you pass 25. Do you actually have a great aunt Marilyn? I do, who's married to my great uncle Lloyd, who'd guffaw. He's the only person I know who actually guffaws as he ogled my date, telling me I'd better snap this one up quick. She looks like a keeper. Now I'm sorry I'm going to miss it. For me, it's my maternal grandmother, particularly, who'll give me a long, piercing look while reminding me having a career is fine, but a job doesn't warm the bed at night and won't put a baby in my arms. Ouch. Yeah, Grammy always manages the two for one, marriage and babies. Her first comment when I got engaged, it's about time. And when you ended it? I can thank my mother, with the full backing of her sister, for warning Grammy off. Apparently, Tracy got a stinging lecture, and I got a warm, sympathetic call. Grammy's okay. Yeah, she is. But if I took you to a wedding, I'd get that long, piercing look. They let the dogs out while they dealt with the dishes. Just as Sonia wondered how long the normal would last, she saw that all the cabinet doors in the butler's pantry stood open. Oh, well. She walked in to close them. Did anything happen today? Nothing new or noteworthy. I looked at the clock whenever I came down. It's where you put it, 420. Otherwise, Casper the friendly housekeeper was on the job. Casper? I'm considering the name gender neutral, even though I think female. She made my bed, lit the library fire, washed and folded the dog towels, and Clover provided my office music as usual. His smile spread. You're calling her Clover. She told me to, musically. Crimson and Clover, Sonia sang, over and over. Instead of the slow smile, he shot her a quick grin equally appealing. Got it, and you can sing. Carrying a tune isn't singing. You can sing, he repeated. Something you kept under wraps after pot roast. You won't get away with that again. So nothing from the third floor? Not today. And every day there isn't is a good one. How do you feel about watching a movie? Do you want to use the media room? Actually, I don't think I'm quite ready for an evening down there. I use the library. 
Works for me, depending. What kind of movies do you go for? I can go for a rom-com now and then, but I also like action movies, thrillers. I've binged horror flicks for now. You like horror movies? A lot. But like the media room, not ready to watch one here. I'm also a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Are you really? I will confess, she said. Iron Man is my superhero boyfriend. It used to be Spider-Man, but I've aged out, and it just doesn't feel right to lust after a high school kid. Enough said. Okay, another Stan Lee fan. Between one thing and another, I haven't seen the Marvels yet. Then we have a winner. Got popcorn? Duh. I'm going to get my bag out of the truck and change. Normal, she thought. Even ordinary could equal just lovely. Dinner and a movie at home. Popcorn and a couple cold Cokes. For now, this minute, perfect. With the dogs once again dried off, they trailed her up to the library. Trey stood now, like her, in sweats, studying her board. He took the tray she carried with popcorn, Cokes, dog treats, and set it on the desk. I like it. The colors are going to catch the eye. Dynamic colors. Even a guy who just gears up for some touch football after Thanksgiving dinner likes to think he's dynamic. The font you have for sports and the company name has movement. I just tweaked what we'd done before. Boosted it a little, so it looks faster. It works. This sketch? He tapped one. I like the way you've piled and arranged sports equipment on a field. Could be any kind of playing field. Football helmet, baseball bat, cleats, running shoe. You've got your lacrosse stick, basketball, swimming goggles, part of a dirt bike, a hockey puck, golf club, a belay rope, right? Yeah, maybe it's too crowded. But it's not. I don't know how you figured it out, but it's balanced. The tag under it. It's a tag, I think. Game on? That's a challenge. You got game? Come to Ryder Sports. Every professional inch of her relaxed and warmed. That's just what I was aiming for. So if that's what you see, it's a good start. What else have you got in mind? I don't want to change the infrastructure of the website. It's user-friendly, but I'd like to add a gallery. Photos of regular people using rider gear. Clothes, equipment, like a woman on a bike, a guy swinging a golf club, kids playing basketball, that sort of thing. I have to think it through, but it could add a bang and double as ads since they want a full campaign. Digital, TV, in-store posters, like whatever your game, if I stick with that tag, Ryder Sports gives you the edge. You sold me. The dogs followed them up the curve of stairs, then settled down to munch their dog biscuits. With popcorn, Sonia and Trey sat on the leather sofa, feet on the coffee table. After the movie, the sofa seemed the perfect place to tangle together while the dog snoozed. Later in bed, they tangled again. As she drifted off to sleep, Sonia thought if this was the wide open sexual energy of beginnings, it really, really worked. In the second parlor, just before three, the old grandfather clock's pendulum began to tick. Back and forth, back and forth as the hands on the moon-faced dial revolved, and the clock struck three. The first gong woke them both. The dogs leaped up and snarled. It's louder. Sonia gripped Trey's arm. Is it louder? Than it was last night? Yeah. He rolled out of bed, then grabbed his sweatpants. I'll go check it out. The dogs will stay with you. Please. She found her clothes in the dim light of the fire. All of us. All of us, then. When they reached the door of her sitting room, piano music drifted up. Just another 3 a.m. in the manor, she murmured. It has to mean something. The time. It's too consistent not to. As they came down the stairs, he looked toward the portrait. And the song. She always plays the same one. But when they reached the music room, it stopped. You saw Clover, but whoever's playing, and I still think Astrid, either isn't ready or can't, I guess it's materialize. Your guess is as good as mine. They continued down the hall. 
The dog stopped at the door to the second parlor and snarled again. Sonia's breath backed up in her lungs until she had to push it out. The hands moved to three. She stepped in because he did. And it's cold, Trey. Even as she spoke, the keys on the piano in the music room crashed with crazed chords. The pendulum on the clock began to sway again, and each second ticked off like a fired bullet. With the hair standing up on the back of their necks, the dogs barked frenzied warnings. Doors flew open, doors slammed shut. The light tray had flipped on, flickered, and went out. In the dark, something brushed by her, something so cold it burned. Something's in here. Breathless, she groped for his hand. I felt it. It touched me. Next time we bring a flashlight. Something hit the front door like a battering ram. On those wild barks, the dogs flew out of the room and toward the sound. Come on. Trey pulled her from the room. You're going to open the door. Jesus, listen to that wind. The waves. Look, look, it's ice hitting the windows. So she can pull out a nor'easter. When he reached the door, he pulled it open to a still night and a swimming moon. But it's an illusion. Damn good one. Oh, the dogs. They're fine. She's not out there. I think she's done for the night. I think that's all she's got. That was plenty. Because she shivered, he stepped back to put an arm around her. We can go to my place if you want to get out of here. No, absolutely not. She's not going to win this, not going to chase me out of my own home. But something was in that room, Trey. I swear it touched me, brushed by my arm. She shoved her sleeve up. Look, there's a mark. The pale pink mark, smaller than her palm, marked her skin just above her left elbow. It's an ice burn, a mild one. An ice burn? Let me get the dogs in. We'll put a warm compress on it, see how that does. It's barely pink, and the skin's not cracked or broken. Hold on a second. While he called the dogs, locked back up, she stared at the brush mark on her arm. It touched me. Something, someone who'd lived and died had touched her. It did feel like a burn, but cold. Let's do this in the kitchen. Does it hurt? No. Well, a little sore, I guess. But Trey, the lead is, it, she, touched me and I felt it. I felt her. Just for a second, but look, it's already fading. He stopped to take a closer look. Okay, yeah, it is. We'll make the compress in case. But it looks like she doesn't have as much punch as she'd like. That was punch enough. In the kitchen, Sonia dropped down on a stool. I mean, holy shit. The house is quiet now. All that didn't last more than five minutes. He put a shallow bowl of water in the microwave to heat it, then poured her a glass. She took it, drank. Serious question. Do you ever get rattled? I was a little rattled. But it's interesting, isn't it? That she pulled out so many of the stops to scare us. Interesting. She drank again. There's a word. The thing is, it didn't work. She shot him a look. I was scared, really scared. But you're still sitting here. After testing the water, he soaked a clean cloth, wrung it out. You can barely see it now, but safer is better than sorry. We'll just hold it on there. I don't like being scared. She muttered it. It pissed me off, says the woman who likes horror flicks. And novels. That's a different kind of scared. I want her out of my house. If it takes finding the rings to get her the hell out of my house, I'll find the damn rings. Somehow. The rest? I'll give the rest. Interesting. Holding the compress against her arm with one hand, he brushed her hair back with the other. Finding something just means looking in the right place. Oh, is that all? Now he pressed his lips to her forehead. We're not going to let her win. When the cloth cooled, he took another look. It's like it was never there. And it's not sore at all, she added. Not much punch. Lifting her arm, 
He brushed his lips where the mark had been. Are you going to be able to sleep? I hope so. And I hope she's done for a while. I don't want my mother going through that and trying to haul me back to Boston. I'm betting you got some of that stand your ground from your mother. When they reached the second parlor, where the light glowed again, he went in, opened the clock face. Might as well make her work for it. This time, he turned the hand to 7.10. Owen and I could move the clock out of the house. I don't think that would stop it. And it's kind of a warning when it sounds. I wonder if Colin heard it. He didn't wind the clock, but he kept it here, not up or down in storage. If you change your mind, we'll take it out. He slid an arm around her waist as they walked back to the staircase. She was in there with us, Trey. I've felt cold spots before, but not like that, and not like the gold room. It's a mean cold when it's her. I guess that's a warning, too. Maybe you get rattled, Sonia, but you don't stay rattled. My money's on you. In bed, she curled up against him. I'm really glad you're here. So am I. Closing her eyes, she let the steady beat of his heart lull her until she slept. Part three, spirits. Let us have a quiet hour. Let us hob and knob with death. Alfred Lord Tennyson, The Vision of Sin. Chapter 21. On Friday, after Yoda stopped sulking because he didn't have Mookie, Sonia cheered him up with a trip to the village for scallops, angel hair pasta, and something called unbleached flour. She hadn't known they bleached flour. A quick run left her plenty of time to arrange the tulips she'd bought for her mother's room and start her first attempt at making bread. We're not afraid, are we, Yoda? We're not afraid of some flour and beer and butter and whatever. Not when we live in the haunted manor. Maybe a little afraid, but if we fail, we dump it and she'll never know. After following Bree's instructions to the letter, she stared at the raw dough in the loaf pan. I guess it looks like bread dough. How would I know anyway? Fingers mentally crossed, she slid it into the oven, set the timer, and decided it wasn't obsessive not to leave the kitchen. Instead, she rearranged the fruit bowl a couple of times, paced, played a quick game of tug. Look, it's sort of plumping up. It's the beer, I looked it up. And it's browning some too. Can you smell that? I can smell it. When the timer finally went off, she remembered she was supposed to tap the bread and see if it sounded hollow. It made no sense to her, but she tapped. I guess it does. Anyway, I can't stand it. After shaking the bread into her oven-mitted hand, she turned it onto the cooling rack, stepped back. Now, I'm asking you, Yoda, is that or is that not the cutest little loaf of bread you've ever seen and made by these hands? Her iPad played John Lee Hooker's Don't Be Messing With My Bread. You got that right. As the bread cooled, she took the flowers, a polishing cloth and polish up to the second floor with Yoda at her heels. She'd come back to the linen closet for fresh sheets and towels. When she got to the room she'd chosen, she smelled the fresh polish on furniture that shined. Fresh, fluffy towels hung in the ensuite, which also shined, and more towels stood carefully rolled in a basket. Well, thank you. It's perfect. She set down the flowers. She'll love it. She'll like the view of the woods. She noticed the pretty purple bowl that matched the violets on the wallpaper above the wainscoting and the little crystal clock with the right time beside it. She couldn't swear they hadn't been there before, but either way, they're nice touches, thoughtful. As she walked through the spotless house, she decided whoever made it spotless must love it as much as she did. And since everything looked perfect, she went back to work. She's going to text when she's 30 minutes out, so meanwhile, we'll get some work in. With no Mookie, Yoda contented himself by curling up under her desk. When she got the text, she shut down, hurried to the kitchen to make the salad. She had a moment of shock when she saw neither bread nor rack. Oh no, I then saw the loaf shape wrapped in a clean white cloth. 
I guess I missed that part of the process. She considered the timing perfect when she tucked the salad in the fridge, and Yoda ran barking to the door. Rushing after, Sonia threw open the door and wrapped Winter in a hug. From the tablet in the kitchen, Taylor Swift sang, The Best Day. I missed you. I missed you too. Oh my God, Sonia, this house. Oh, this dog. Look at that sweet face. Look at that handsome boy. Yoda instantly collapsed, exposed his belly, and looked up at Winter with pure love. Obliging, Winter crouched down, rubbed and cooed. You came straight from work. Trim in her dark suit, Winter gave Yoda's belly a last rub. Took off early as planned and put my bag in the car this morning. And Cleo stuffs in there too. She straightened to give Sonia another hard hug. I didn't want to waste time getting here. You look good. FaceTiming isn't the same as real timing. And that goes for the house too. Holy jumping Jesus, Sonia, my jaw literally dropped. It's so you. It is? This is always what you wanted. Well, she qualified as she looked around the foyer. Maybe more than you imagined, or I did. That staircase. She wandered forward, stopped. These rooms, a piano, one of two. Why don't we go up? See if you like the room I chose for you. I'll give you a quick tour. A full one would take too long. No, I've got your bag. Thanks, baby. You told me it felt like yours. They crossed to the staircase, started up. Now I can see it. But there's so much of it. What are you doing with all this room? I have my spots. She gestured toward the library. Such as? Oh, well, wow. How do you ever leave this? It's like something out of a movie. And look at Xena thriving. Turning a circle, Winter studied Sonia's mood boards. Doing good, interesting work while you're at it. I think so. And I'll fill you in on all that. And everything else, Sonia thought. Colin Poole must have loved this house to preserve and maintain it so well. I've been a little worried about that part with you. Now I'll worry a lot less. Everything just shines, baby. You must have found a hell of a cleaning service. She decided on, it's kind of miraculous. We'll talk about that too. We're in the North Wing. Listen to you. On a laugh, Winter elbowed her daughter. North Wing. With Yoda prancing between them, Sonia led her mother toward the bedrooms. I'm at the end of the hall. You know I have to look. And it's just lovely. Oh, seriously lovely. Lady of the Manor. Do you watch the sunrise from your terrace doors? I do. I gave you a different view. But you've got your pick. You're a park walker. I suppose I am. So I put you down the hall, and on this side facing west. It's quieter too, I think. She opened a door. Let's see if it works for you. Oh, this is beautiful. Like my own suite in the world's classiest B&B. Look at the wallpaper. It's so sweet. And my own little fireplace. I'm gonna feel like a rock star sleeping in that bed. Winter brushed her fingers over the tulips. Thank you, sweetheart, for knowing me so well. I love looking out at the woods. If you want to unpack, I can help. Or after working most of the day and driving from Boston, we can have a glass of wine. See, you know your mom. Let's have some wine. On the way down, she showed Winter Cleo's room, then the secret door. Is it safe? Frowning, Winter peered down the steps. Do you go in there? It's the most direct way to the gym. Down, and the attic, up. I'm trying to use the gym three or four mornings a week. I'll show you around in that part tomorrow if you want. Maybe. Did you hear that? I thought I heard bells. Sonia echoed Trey's words from her first day. You'll have this. She shut the door. Music room, she said as they continued. Is that a hurdy-gurdy? I've never seen one outside of a museum. The painting. She's lovely. Joanna, Colin's wife. He painted it. Talented, very talented, like your dad. Yes, she died a long time ago. He had his office over here, 
where he hung dad's painting. You told me, but I... Yes, that's Drew's work. Moving into the room, Winter studied the painting. Did he come here at some point? Or is that really from his dreams? Some twin connection. I thought you might want it. Oh. Still looking at the painting, Winter reached for Sonia's hand. Thanks for that. But it feels like it belongs here. I wonder how and when Colin Poole acquired it. I like knowing something of Drew's, besides you, has a place here. At the distinctive sound of a door closing, Winter glanced around. Is someone else here? Depends on your definition of someone. To lead her out, Sonia put an arm around her mother's waist. I told you the house is haunted. Yes, but... From the kitchen, Billy Joel sang, bottle of white, bottle of red. We're going with white because I'm making scallops. My always rational daughter's telling me very seriously that her house is haunted and she's making scallops. How much shock do you think my system can handle? That's why wine first. Then this kitchen, Winter said as they reached it. This gorgeous cook's kitchen, this great room, and again this view. They managed to keep the integrity of the house, but ditched the labyrinth feel with this space, opening up instead. Now I have kitchen envy. Running a hand over the island, Winter shook her head at Sonia. I failed to interest you enough in cooking, only managed to teach you the bare basics. I made a pot roast dinner for eight, Sonia reminded her as she chose a bottle. And the photo you sent was cookbook worthy. Baby of mine, you actually believe you have ghosts in this house? I don't just believe, Mom. I know. Sonia uncorked the wine as the iPad played, Paul Simon's Mother and Child Reunion. Such as that, Sonia poured the wine. You need to stop now and give me a chance. When the music cut off, Sonia handed her mother a glass. Sit down, Mom. That was Clover. She died in 1965, after giving birth to Colin and Dad. I'm sitting down. There's a lot more. I told you about her from the book I have. From what deuce, Oliver Doyle II told me. At some point, I'm going to try to talk to Greta Poole. The woman Colin thought was his mother, but was actually his aunt. She has dementia. Yes, you told me. You're saying Drew's birth mother is here. In this house. You've seen her? No. She just makes herself known with music. To me. Trey's seen her. Twice now. Trey Doyle. The third Oliver. Right. We're dating. More surprises. Winter took a moment to sip some wine. Why aren't I meeting him tonight? That's such a mom thing. Going straight there when we're talking about the ghost of your mother-in-law. Winter tipped her wine glass towards Sonia. Priorities. First, because he didn't want to intrude. Plus, he has a family wedding tomorrow. You're going to like him. Cleo did. She mentioned him, and that he had his eye on you, and you had yours on him. So I'm not surprised. Trust Cleo. You'll like him, she repeated. He manages to be rock steady and easygoing at the same time. The point is you like him. I'm glad you found someone you like. I'm glad you look happy. You sound happy. I am happy. It's been strange, okay? Getting used to the move, then the haunted thing. When we go up after dinner, which I'm going to start in just a minute, we're going to find your bed turned down, your fire lit. Mom, I haven't hired a cleaning service because apparently I inherited one. I see. Do you? Winter drank wine, rubbed Yoda when he planted his front paws on the stool. When I finally got you to sleep the night after the horrible day your father died, I didn't know how I'd cope, how I'd get through the next hour, much less the next day, next week, next year. And I saw him. I went into our room, and he was there. He told me we'd be all right, that he'd loved me every minute of every day since we met. You never told me that. No, I never did. I thought it was grief. But it wasn't. 
not only. Sometimes I'd feel his hand on my cheek as I fell asleep. I still do now and then, or hear his voice inside my head when I'm struggling with a decision or problem. Trust your gut, babe, then check in with your heart. Smiling, she set down her glass, reached for Sonia's hand. If I believe there's an after, and I do, why not believe that whatever made that person who they were, the essence of them, could linger? Is that why you never remarried? Because you felt he was still here? It might have played a part, but no. What your dad and I had, it was magic. On a sigh, a loving one, Winter laid her free hand on her heart. Right from the start, we had magic. I never felt that with or for anyone else. Why would I settle for less? She squeezed Sonia's hand. Still, you're so much alone here. Excluding you, she said to Yoda. Are you afraid? Sometimes. And I'm glad Cleo's moving in. Because Cleo, and it'll be nice to have someone here. Ad will use more of the house, because Cleo. I have to remind myself not to burrow in the library. There's a lot more. I'll tell you while I make dinner. You're not helping. I'm topping off my wine and will sit right here, a fascinated observer. Because she did know her mother, Sonia built her way to the more frightening incidents. Maybe toned them down just a little. When the water boiled for the pasta, she slid it in and set a timer before continuing as she prepped the scallops. Set a second timer there. You saw the mirror, the one your father dreamed of. I can't say for absolute, but I believe I did absolutely. And I know I saw Astrid Poole's murder. I saw Catherine die in a blizzard. I saw Marianne deliver twins and die. And each time, I saw Hester Dobbs. Since you seem to have the cooking miraculously under control, I'm going to set the table. The small one there. The dining room's grand and glorious, but intimidating unless you've got a group. As they worked together, she told Winter about the night Trey saw Clover again. As she began, the tablet played, what a man, and made her laugh. She can't help herself. And that really doesn't give you a chill. Not anymore. I'm telling you all this because I don't want you to freak if anything happens while you're here. And because I want you to know I've got a handle on it. There's a salad in the fridge. I hope this works, hope this works. She heated the skillet on low, dumped in the carefully measured lemon juice, added salt and pepper, no measurement given, then spread the drained pasta on a pretty platter. It smells terrific, Sonia. It does smell good. And in about half a minute, we'll find out if it worked. Did I thank you for letting me give Corinne Doyle the pot roast thing? You did, and she sent me a very nice handwritten thank you. She did? That sounds like her. I've only met her once, but it sounds like her. Here goes. With the care of a diamond cutter and a rare gem, she ladled the scallops and sauce over the pasta, added Parmesan and a sprinkle of chopped parsley and basil. Artistic eye. Presentation was never your problem. You could make a takeout meal look like dinner at a five star. I want you to know I appreciate you making me dinner. At the table, Winter dished up a little salad, then the main. And I'm going for the scallops first because I have to. After forking one and half, then half again, she wound a little angel hair with it, sampled, and sat back. Sonia, it's absolutely wonderful. Is it really? Bypassing the salad, Sonia tried it herself. Oh, it's good. I didn't overcook it. Bree put the fear of God in me on that. Now, who's Bree? Oh, Trey's ex. High school, ex, and friend. She's the head chef at the Lobster Cage, a really good restaurant in the village. It's her recipe. I want it. I'm making this the next time I have friends for dinner. Now, tell me the rest, the ghostly rest. It's the clock. There's a grandfather clock in the second parlor, Sonia told her. Sweetie, that's terrifying. That's Shirley Jackson territory. She burned your arm. Let me see it. There's nothing to see. But to placate, Sonia shoved up the sleeve of her sweater. I'm not going to pretend it wasn't scary. 
or that I haven't jumped out of my skin more than a few times, but you're determined. I know your face. It's my house, Mom. It should have been Dad's. He should have grown up here with his brother. If he had, I might never have met him. We might not have had you. With a smile, Sonia shook her head. Magic, she reminded Winter. You had magic. You'd have found each other, and this would still be my house. I'm going to have one more scallop because they're really good. And I'm going to find those rings. Don't ask me how. Don't have a clue. But I'm going to find them. I could take a leave of absence. Move up here for a few months. You'll do no such thing. Not because I wouldn't love to have you, but because you have a life, a home, a career in Boston. I'm not letting some dead witch beat me. Determined face, Winter murmured. It's always a bride, a new wife or mother. You and Trey aren't thinking about marriage, are you? Mom, we've barely started dating. And I know what dating means for a couple of unattached adults. Maybe he'll spend the night more often. I have the faithful Yoda and soon the fierce Cleo. Which eases my mind. Some. You're still taking this better than I thought you might. I remember your father's dreams, how real they were to him. I guess I was predisposed to this. What would Dad have done if, like Colin, he'd found out about his family history? He'd have come here. Winter said it without hesitation. He'd have done exactly what you're set on doing. He also had a determined face. So I'm going to do what I always did for him, always tried to do for you. I'm going to stand by your determination. I love you, Mom. Sonia, you're the most important thing in my life. Whatever's here, you're happy. I can see how happy you are. And energized. My energy girl lost some of that zip in Boston. It wasn't Boston. I know, and I know you've got it back. Plus, to my genuine amazement, you've now cooked two very impressive meals, so I know you won't rely on pizza and Chinese. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you how to make another meal. Before Sonia could protest, Winter held up a hand and put Sonia's determined face to shame. You've got beef and seafood. I'll show you how to make, as I once failed, a simple chicken dish. But now let's deal with these dishes. We can pour one more glass of wine and take it with us while you show me more of the house. Yoda needs to go out. How about we take him for a walk, then come back for the dishes and the tour? Your house, your rules. They enjoyed the breezy walk with the landscape lights glowing, the stars shimmering. When they rounded back, the kitchen was whistle clean. Well, my God. I wanted you to see. If I don't get to the cleanup right off, someone else does. Now, let me show you the solarium from inside. The weekend flew by, and with nothing more than what Sonia had come to feel was normal for the manor. Welcoming fires in the hearths, open cabinet doors. Though the hands on the clock read three again, she heard nothing in the night, and no disturbances on the third floor. She learned, maybe, how to make a chicken and potato dish in a single skillet, and pleased Winter. And since the whole deal, start to finish, took under an hour, she thought she could handle it in a pinch. At the door on Sunday afternoon, her bag at her feet, Winter embraced her daughter. Cleo will be here in a few days. Next time I visit, I bet I have her mom with me. I hope so. Your aunt misses you. Is it all right if I bring her up sometime? I love summer, you know that. Of course it is. Good, that's good. Tracy gets no points from me, but she did you a favor, Sonia, because you're happy. Taking Sonia's shoulders, Winter rubbed gently. As happy as I've seen you in way too long. And you were losing that zip before you booted Brandon to the curb. Shakira's infidelity song, Don't Bother, sang from the phone in Sonia's pocket. Oh, I agree. Winter laughed with it. My girl will be just fine. I think you and Clover would have gotten along. Enough that however strained it is, I like knowing she's watching out for you. You take care of yourself. You're my favorite daughter. You drive safe and text me when you get home. They hugged hard, swayed with it. You're my favorite mother. Bye, sweet doggy.
Bending, she gave Yoda rubs and kisses. And you tell the guy you're dating, I expect to meet him the next time I'm here. I will. And Mom, I love knowing you and Dad had magic. The magic made you. Stay happy. Sonia watched her go as Yoda danced in the doorway and whined. I know, but she'll come back. And if I visit there, I'll take you with me. But we're good here. She looked down at him as they both stood in the open doorway. She felt spring creeping into the air. I was going to wear you out with a game of tug, though that takes some doing. Then I was going to work until I had leftover chicken for dinner. You know what? Obviously riveted, he angled his head and stared up at her. Screw work. It's Sunday afternoon. I'm going to grab a jacket. Don't need more today. And that ball I bought last time I was in the village. We're going to take a walk and play ball. When we're done with that, we're going to come in and snuggle right up with a book. Unless we feel more like a movie. She bent down. What do you say to that? Since he raced in circles, she decided he felt fine about it. You hang on a minute. She got a jacket, the little red ball. They worked on fetch. He resisted bringing the ball back in the slushy snow. As they played, the shadow moved across the window, watching. Glancing up, Sonia shielded her eyes with the flat of her hand. On impulse, she raised her other in a wave and saw the shadow move. She had no doubt in that moment. It waved back. All right, then, she said aloud and nodded. Okay. When she heard a bang, she looked to the third floor. She watched the windows in the gold room fly open, slam shut. Yoda let out three snapping barks. I agree, Sonia told him, and shot up a middle finger. Deliberately, she turned her back to the windows, threw the ball for Yoda again. Watch how much we give a tiny damn about you. By the end of the fetch session, the window stopped banging, and she'd managed to train Yoda to not only bring the ball back, but drop it in her hand. Such a good boy, such a smart boy. You deserve a treat. In full agreement, he swung into his happy circles before racing her back to the house. Clover greeted her with Fogarty's wicked old witch. Bet your ass she is. And yet, Sonia thought as she went back to the kitchen to get Yoda his treat. Other than ringing the bells, moving the hands on the clock, the house had stayed mostly quiet during her mother's visit. After making herself some tea, she settled down in the library with her book while Yoda napped. Clover played a medley of artists and eras, and Sonia read about the hunt for a serial killer who collected the eyeballs of his victims. Gruesome, she said as she closed the book. I loved it. As she gave some vague thoughts to dinner and a movie, Trey texted. Why do weddings suck up an entire weekend? Wedding brunch this morning. Then I'm pulled into a post-wedding drinks and dinner where I'm limited to one beer as DD, driving my grandparents home, if we ever leave. Hope your weekend with your mom required less energy. Can I take you to dinner tomorrow? Weddings are a once-in-a-lifetime event. Everyone hopes, anyway. Had a great weekend with my mom, wherein I stunned her with my success with Bree's recipe. I owe the chef major thanks, and you can absolutely take me to dinner tomorrow. Congrats. I'll shoot to get to you by seven. How were Great Aunt Marilyn and Great Uncle Lloyd? Marilyn and Lloyd were, and are, in their usual form, only sharpened by the fact Anna and my cousin Liam's wife Gwen are both pregnant. I've got to get back to the table. See you tomorrow night. Too soon to sign off with a heart emoji, she decided. After some internal debate, she admitted fell on the silly side. She settled on a smiley face with red lips and long eyelashes. When you had to fret over emojis, she thought, your dating skills needed honing. Down in the kitchen again, she fed the dog, warmed up some leftovers. When the I'm home text from her mother came through, no need to fret over emojis. She treated herself to a face mask, opted to go all in with a hair mask, then a long, indulgent shower. By nine, in her pajamas, she snuggled down on the second floor of the library with Yoda. After the serial killer, she leaned toward something light as a palate cleanser. With some regret, she scrolled past several horror movies and settled on a comedy. And by 10, she drifted off to sleep. Shortly after, into dreams. 
Chapter 22 The mirror glowed, its glass blurred with color and movement. Around its frame, the predator's eyes seemed to gleam. Dimly, she heard music, voices, a quick, bright laugh. She stepped through and stood in the ballroom under the brilliant light of a trio of chandeliers. Rather than shrouded furniture crowding the space, divans and chairs in deep colors ran along the walls, and the floors shined under that sparkling light. An orchestra played, harp, violin, flute, what she thought might be a piccolo. And yes, she recognized the piano from the music room. Men wearing waistcoats and high collars danced with women in long gowns, many with elaborate sleeves, bell-shaped skirts. Some women wore feathers in their hair or elaborate pins. Jewels glittered as the dancers circled the room in a waltz. Others sat in the seats tucked back against the walls. More stood with drinks in hand by tables laden with food. Crystal flutes of champagne sparkled under the light that showered from the chandeliers. She saw the bride, regal in her white gown, the satin, the lace, the tiara crowning her black hair. A man, tall, dark blonde hair, sharp-jawed, pool green eyes, took her hand, kissed her knuckles. She handed her champagne glass to a servant, then glided onto the dance floor with him. They made a striking couple as they turned, twirled. He smile content, looked at her face. But she, Sonia noted, shifted her gaze to take in the room, to see who watched, to see who admired. Rather than the radiant smile of a new bride, her seemed smug, haughty. When the dance ended, he kissed her hand again. Shall I take you down to supper, Mrs. Poole? Not yet, not quite yet, Mr. Poole. We'll have a ball when the holidays come, shall we? Perhaps a masquerade ball at the turn of the year. How fine it all looks. It pales before the beauty of my bride. Will you sit just a moment or two with my sister? It would mean much to her and to me. Of course. Did I not vow to obey my husband? And I to cherish my wife. He escorted her to the red and gold love seat, where a woman very pregnant, sat. She wore a gown of pale pink, with her hair, deep blonde like her brother's, worn high and smooth. Shall I sit with you a moment, Jane? Oh, please do, Agatha. What a happy day. I'll fetch you champagne, Agatha. Shall I bring you some, Jane? Thank you, no, Owen. I'm very content. The baby likes the music. He's dancing. Her face glowed as she said it. George went to look in on the children. It was kind of you, Agatha, to open the nursery for them. It wouldn't do to have bored children underfoot. They have their nursemaid to tend them. Of course, of course. But I wanted to just take a peek, and George wished to spare me the steps. The music changed to a country dance as Sonia watched Hester Dobbs slip into the room. In her black dress, her hair loose and free, she walked to where a servant arranged some little cakes on a plate. She added another to it, frosted in dark red with a gold crown topping it. Turning, she smiled at Sonia as the servant walked to Agatha and offered her the plate. You can't stop what was, what is. Maybe not, but she could try. Even as Sonia rushed across the room, why did it feel like she swam through syrup? Agatha lifted the red cake to her lips. Sonia struggled her way through the dancers. She felt the heat from their bodies, caught the scent of perfume. One of the women stumbled a bit as Sonia pushed by her. But Agatha was already on her feet, a hand to her throat as she fought for air. Beside her, Jane levered herself up, called for water. Water wouldn't help, Sonia thought. Agatha slid to the floor, eyes wild. Her body shook. The heels of her wedding shoes drummed on the floor. Owen ran to her, dropped down to pull her into his arms. No, she couldn't stop it, Sonia thought, as she watched the life begin to drain out of the bride's eyes. 
Women screamed. One fainted. In the confusion, Hester Dobbs pulled the wedding ring from Agatha's finger and slid it on her own. With my blade, I took the first. Then by my blood, this house was cursed. One by one, they wed, they die, because they seek to take what's mine. And with their rings of gold, my spell will hold and hold. Once again, she smiled at Sonia. Then she lifted her hands, flicked her fingers, and vanished. Sonia woke standing beside the sofa. She shook, not from fear, but rage. She'd watched another woman die and had been helpless to stop it. Could she change what had already happened? Agatha Poole died in, how the hell could she remember? But the fourth bride had been dead over a hundred years. And yet Sonia had been there, in the ballroom at that time, in that place. She'd witnessed what had been another murder. Yoda whined and shivered. She sat, let him jump into her lap. Where do I go? Is it an actual mirror or just something in a dream? Maybe some kind of subconscious device rather than an actual mirror. And it was too damn late to worry about it now. I'm sorry, baby. I fell asleep and didn't let you out. It's okay. We'll take care of that immediately. She let him out through the mudroom stood drinking a glass of water while she waited for him to come back. Though tempted to write it all out then and there, she knew she wouldn't forget the details. Morning would do fine, especially since it wasn't far off. With the dog, she went upstairs. He got into his bed and she into hers. In the faint glow of the fire, she lay taking stock. No, she wasn't afraid. If her mother had been there, Winter would have recognized her daughter's determined face. Over coffee in the morning, she wrote it all out, added a number of sketches, then put it aside. With the caterer's job completed, she shifted her focus to the Doyle project. Since she wanted photos, she contacted Corinne Doyle. Enlisting her as photographer proved as simple as asking. Check that off. She made a check mark in the air. For the rest of the morning, she worked on the design, the structure, and fell nicely into routine. Work, walk, work. Because she didn't want to get too deeply into it before she had the photos, she moved over to the florist. New photos there, too, which the florist had already sent, following Sonia's vision. They'd work, she thought, as she studied them, and save the client the cost of a photographer. Clover blasted out with, devil with a blue dress on. Hey, volume. Sonia started to turn it down herself, then saw the time. Okay, I get it. Nearly six. Time to knock off and change. She found the red dress laid out on her bed. Still no. Eventually, it'll be the right choice, but tonight. She studied her closet, pulled out a navy blue dress with a belted waist and pencil skirt. This is better for dinner in the village. Because she continued to drag her feet on a hairstylist, she opted to sort of bundle it back, clip it up. As Yoda raced downstairs and the bell rang, she took one last turn in front of the mirror. The dogs greeted each other as if it had been years, and the generally easy-moving tray surprised her by pulling her straight in for a long, blood-stirring kiss. I missed that. I missed you. That's really nice to hear. More than a little off balance, Sonia stepped back to let him in. I need to get my coat. I'm going to let them run around outside for a couple minutes, in case. She went to the closet, took a moment to breathe out. When she came back, he turned, smiled at her. Nice coat. She glanced down at the black leather that swung to mid-thigh. I bought it for myself as a, you've got this present when I quit my job to go freelance. Looks like it worked. How about I call the dogs in from the mudroom? Get them wiped down. Good idea. She breathed out again. Trey? He glanced back at her. I missed you too. I was hoping. As she stood waiting, Clover wound up with the Beatles, if I fell. Just ease back, not ready yet. Clock's back at three, he commented, 
as the dogs raced back ahead of him. Every morning, I've got a story for you. Tell you on the way. You boys behave, stay out of the liquor, and don't make any prank calls. Now you've given them ideas. When they went out, she looked at the gunmetal gray sedan next to her car. That's not your truck. No, but it's my car. She slid in. It's nice. So, recovered from the wedding? Mostly. Then today, my mother ambushed me for pictures. No headshots, no posing. That's from you, I take it. It is. Your job's top of the list now. What about Ryder? We can wait, Sonia, if you want to work on that. It gets an hour a day. Because she had a plan and a schedule. Which is enough until I pull it more together. Just so you know, if you want to take more time for it, we're not in a hurry. Now, what's the story? I went through the mirror again. Wait, she held up a hand as he started to speak. I didn't call you because I wasn't afraid. I wasn't. By the end, I was just furious, but not scared. All right. I sense you're not convinced. So let me start at the top. When she finished, he glanced over. She ended with poetry? Yes, but like a spell or a charm, I think. I need to ask Cleo about that. But the fact is, someone I bumped felt it, like I felt Dobbs that night. That's interesting, to use your word. And it felt like I was wading through mud when I tried to run, to stop Agatha from eating that damn pedophore. Her death's listed as choking, but sounds like poison. It was anaphylactic shock, I'm nearly sure. I knew a girl in college with a peanut allergy. We were all out one night and something she ate. It was really scary, even though she had an EpiPen. This reminded me of that, only it happened so fast. So maybe some poison with it? Hester Dobbs put something in that cake that caused the reaction. As it played back so clearly in her head, Sonia shifted in her seat to face him. She couldn't breathe, Trey. She knew I couldn't stop it. Hester knew. And that just infuriated me. Then I started thinking. He parked at the lobster cage. Is this okay for dinner? Oh, yes. I'd like to thank Bree in person for the recipe. Hold on to what you started thinking. The same love-struck hostess seated them in the same corner booth. He ordered wine, then nodded at her. You were thinking? It's not her. I mean... I don't think it's Hester Dobbs jump-starting these dreams or experiences. Why? Why would she want me to see, to have the details? It doesn't give her any advantage, but it gives me one. He gestured to her when the server brought out the wine, chatted with her, an older woman this time, about her new granddaughter. Give us a few more minutes, will you, Dana? You bet, but take my word, the lobster risotto is tops tonight. When she left them, Trey didn't miss a beat. Did you do sketches? Yes. I want to see them. And you've made a good point. I don't see any benefit to her letting you see what she did, or how she did it. How's murky, she said, but Trey shook his head. You're an eyewitness, and you see and remember details. So I'm saying you're right. Why would she want a witness? Do you want the risotto? I really do. That works. I want crab cakes. Once they'd ordered, he slid right back in. I think it's Astrid. Why Astrid? She's the first. She was there, obviously, from the start. And since we accept she's been in the manor since, she'd have seen the rest. She's a witness, too. That's logical, in this illogical situation. And it helped so much to have someone who could be logical, someone she trusted to talk through it all. One of the details, I don't think Agatha was in love with Owen Poole. Not like crazy deeply. And she struck me as, I don't think she was a particularly nice woman. More just a snob. I think he cared about her, but same goes. Not the snob. He seemed warmer somehow. But I think it was what they called a good match, if you follow. He remarried under two years later. Pretty sure it was less than two. About a year and a half, I checked. And he and his wife, Moira, had six kids and nearly five decades together. 
I don't know if that matters, but apparently second brides aren't in the danger zone. One a generation. Which means me. Or, I guess, any bride of my generation who gets married in or lives in the manor. It has to be there, because Dobbs is stuck there too. After my mother left Sunday, I went out to play fetch with Yoda. He's getting the hang of it. The shadow I've seen at the library window? I waved. It waved back. Because it made him laugh, she grinned. And right after, Hester started slamming the windows in the gold room. Very pissy. I gave her the middle finger salute. The way he looked at her in just that moment had her heart doing a slow roll. You're one in a million, cutie. I don't know about that, but I know how to get pissy right back. When Dana served the mains, Sonia looked at her plate, then up at Dana. I can tell you were right. Never wrong. She winked and left them alone. Tell me about the wedding, the one that didn't end with a dead bride. Please don't make me. Fill me in on your weekend instead. What's one thing? No, two, Sonia amended. Two things that stick out. Then we'll close the door on your weekend adventure and move to mine. The bride's Uncle Jerry got shit-faced, jumped on stage with the band and belted out ACDC's You Shook Me All Night Long. He waited a beat. While stripping, they managed to stop him before he lost his pants. There were children present, but it was close. As she laughed, he tried some of her risotto. And for the second, I found the best man and the bride's brother in an extremely compromising situation in the men's room. You walked in on them? Lock the door, man. He pressed his fingers to his eyes. Use a stall, rent a room. Before I could back out, they told me to congratulate them. They're engaged. Aw, did you? Congratulate them? Yeah, while my retinas were bleeding because I'd seen entirely too much of both of them. Things I can never unsee. I said congratulations and got the hell out of there. I hope those crazy kids make it. Your family has exciting weddings. I wish I'd been there. He studied her over a sip of wine. You actually mean that. I worry about you. I like weddings. They're full of color and drama and joy. And drunken relatives. The best ones are. Your turn. My weekend can't compare to yours. But there is my mother's reaction to spending hers with ghosts, which was surprisingly steady. She told him. It sounds like I had it right. You got a lot of your steady from your mother. I didn't realize when my father died how much she had to take on. You don't think of things like that when you're 12. And by the time I grew up enough to realize it, it just was. She gave me stability. It says something that she senses your dad with her. What does it say? That love, the real deal, lasts. The real deal gives you strength. You must be right, because I don't know anyone stronger than Winter McTavish. By the way, since she immediately and correctly interpreted my term, dating, she pointed a finger at him, then at herself. She demands to meet you the next time she's here. I'll look forward to that. He glanced over. Here comes Bree. This time, the chef scooted Trey over to look directly at Sonia. I can't look in your eyes with a text, so tell me again you didn't overcook the scallops or pasta. You scared me enough on that. I set timers. My mother was so shocked and impressed, she forced me back to the kitchen on Saturday and whipped me through a chicken dish. So my thanks is qualified by fear and annoyance, as she told me she's going to teach me a different dish whenever she visits. Didn't she ever teach you growing up? She tried. I'd chop and stir if cornered. But I was slippery, and I stand as one of her few failures. Bree nodded, considered. I still like you. Rock hard's back in Agonquint next week, she told Trey. I'm going next Monday. You should come. Bring her. I gotta get back. She hopped up, took off. So, Sonia picked up her wine. She and Manny have solidified their thing. Looks that way. Do you want to go hear some music next week? I would. Rock hard and Manny live bold in my imagination. But Cleo's coming in a few days. I don't want to ditch her for an evening so soon. Does she like music? She does. Owen will definitely be up for going. We can make it a group thing. It sounds like fun. I'll ask her. But then there's Yoda. My parents take on Mookie if I'm going to be gone more than a couple hours. They'll take Yoda. 
Think about it. Ask Cleo. She would, and did some of that thinking on the drive home. I should get Yoda a dog house. The weather's breaking, and he'd have somewhere to chill when he's outside. You should ask Owen to build him one. Owen builds dog houses? Not for everybody, but Owen can build anything. You should see the one we built for Jones. It's a dog palace. It's got Wi-Fi. Get out of here. It's heated with a circulating fan to cool it in the summer. Two bunks, in case he has a pal over like Mookie last weekend. It's got a friggin' porch, windows, with screens. You said we built. I'm just the free labor. He's the genius. Which explained his working man hands, Sonia thought. Does Mookie have one? Mookie's is more of a playhouse. He's still a kid, really. And he lacks Jones's taste for the finer things. Does it have Wi-Fi? It does not. He pulled up at the manor. Mookie also lacks Jones's spookily superior intellect. I'm not sorry about that. But it has its amenities. Yoda wants one. Discuss it with Owen, Trey said as they walked to the door. He believes in the barter system. After the dogs greeted them and everyone had a walk around, Trey took her hand at the door. I'd like to stay. Her answer was to pull him inside with her. Did you think you were going somewhere? He woke when the clock struck three, and beside him she stirred. Pulling her close, he pressed his lips to her hair. Not tonight, just sleep. If she dreamed, she didn't remember, and fell smoothly back into routine. By midday, she had a selection of photos to consider for the Doyle project. Asking Corinne, she decided, had been the perfect move. Not only good photos, but the woman knew all the subjects, and it showed. She didn't think twice about which to use of Trey. His mother caught him leaning back against his desk, his phone at his ear. Untucked shirt, dark jeans, scarred boots crossed at the ankles. It captured his calm energy. A contradiction in terms, she thought. But that was Trey Doyle. Just as she'd captured her father-in-law in his three-piece suit, glasses at the tip of his nose as he pulled a law book from the shelf. These are good. They're damn good. Let's make them work. She spent the rest of the day on it, and most of the next. And in her opinion, it did work, and well. In anticipation of Cleo's arrival the next day, she took Yoda into the village for some supplies and flowers. On her way out again, her phone rang. She tapped the button on the steering wheel to answer. This is Sonia. Hey, Sonia, Anna, I'm right behind you. Sonia glanced in the rear view. Oh, well, hi. I don't suppose I could talk you into turning around. I'll buy you a cup of coffee. I was going to text you. I'd like to talk to you about a couple of things. I'd turn around, but I've got the dog with me. Why don't you come up? I'll buy you the decaffeinated beverage of your choice. Love it, thanks. I'll see you in a few. While Sonia chose happy daffodils for Cleo's room, Cleo pulled up in front of the manor. As she didn't see Sonia's car, she considered the wisdom of her one day early surprise. With a shrug, she decided she'd just haul some of her things to the front door, then send Sonia a text. She muscled out a suitcase, pleased that spring teased the air, instead of winter biting it. If Sonia planned to come back soon, she'd wait. If she planned not, well, she'd just drive down to the village and do some exploring until. After dragging the suitcase to the door, it opened. Hey, I didn't think you were home, I... Sonia didn't stand there. No one did. She hesitated, then squared her shoulders. She'd live here, so she'd better get used to it. When she walked in, the music pumped. Neil Young and Crazy Horses, welcome back. I'll take that as a good sign. As a precaution, she propped her suitcase against the door. It weighed a ton because she had a ton of clothes and wasn't sorry. She hauled her second one, then her weekender, then the last of her boxes before shutting the door. She looked at the staircase, looked at her suitcases, sighed. She still wasn't sorry. She'd pulled, yanked, carried the first to the landing when the banging started and the servant's door creaked open. She heard the bell, dim but insistent. She stepped toward it.
Chapter 23 Sonia spotted Cleo's car when she made the turn, and everything in her lit up bright. She pulled up, jumped out. She expected to see suitcases, boxes when she peered in. Either you bought a second car or you already have company. Anna walked over to Sonia. It's Cleo's. I didn't expect her until tomorrow. The friend who's moving in. What a nice surprise. Listen, I'll take off. Leave you two alone to get her settled in. We can do this later. No, come in. From her car, Sonia grabbed the flowers and grocery bags. You should meet her, wherever she is. She must be inside. I don't know how, because I always lock up when I leave. They walked to the house together. See? At the locked door, Sonia took out her key. Yoda raced in first and sniffed at the suitcases. Her things. Cleo? Her voice just echoed back. Hell with that. Taking out her phone, she texted. Where are you? The response took a minute. BRT. Be right there from where? Sonia muttered. That's another of her bags up there. Maybe she... She broke off as the servant's door opened. Cleo stepped out. She shoved a hand at her hair, then lifted her arms in the air. Surprise! You scared the crap out of me! Sorry, I got everything done and thought, why the hell should I wait until morning? So here I am, she continued as she walked down the stairs. How did you get in? The door opened, just like that one did. She pointed up. But man is first, as my mama says. Hi, I'm Cleo Fabre. Anna Doyle. I know I recognized you from your website. Wonderful work, by the way. The site and the pottery. And would you look, it's now 5.02. Give me some wine, Sone. I've had my first solo adventure. Sit in the parlor with Anna. Anna doesn't need to sit in the parlor, Anna said. The kitchen's fine. I'd like to hear about the solo adventure. You don't seem worried about it. Got some chills, literally, but no, I'm not worried. We have this fierce guard dog. She crooned to Yoda, gave him some loving rubs. You're even more adorable in person. She straightened and continued as they started back. And I've got one of my grandmare's charms in my pocket. Her grandmother's a Creole witch, maybe. You've got my full attention. You get the drink, Sonia. I'll put the groceries away. What would you like, Anna? Still studying Cleo as if fascinated, Anna said, Ginger ale if you have it. Okay, to start, Cleo said to Anna. A friend's taken over my apartment. A friend I'm fond of, but grew less fond of every day since she moved in. She's not easy to live with. Sonia is. So when I realized I had everything done, I ran. Since I'm also fond of the surprise, I didn't give Sonia a heads up. That's on me. I would have been here. Yeah, but then I wouldn't have had my first solo adventure. You got toaster strudels. She knows I have a weakness. So when I didn't see Sonia's car, I realized my surprise might have been a little ill-conceived, but what the hell, she'd be back. I hauled one of my ridiculously heavy suitcases to the door, and it opened. She picked up the wine Sonia set in front of her. I came in. I don't think of myself as a coward, Anna considered as she sipped her drink but I don't think I'd have done that. She would, and did, and the house sang welcome back, or I should say Clover played me in. Clover? You haven't filled her in. I guess not. Then over to you for that. Sonia picked up her wine. Let's sit at the table. She filled in some gaps. And you knew that, and still came in? I think Clover and I will get along fine. We'll see about the rest. So I dragged the first suitcase up those awesome stairs. I love clothes. Me too. We'll shop. I dragged up the suitcase and the secret door opened. And you walked in there too. I thought about it for a second, since I heard those bells, the call bells downstairs. I remember those, sure. They were actually ringing? One was. I started down and the door slammed behind me. Shaking back her hair, she lifted her glass. I admit without shame that scared the shit out of me, but the lights came on when I found the switch, so that was better. When I got down there, the bell for the gold room's banging, doors are slamming, the TV in the media room came on top volume, a lot of screaming seeing as it came on with the latest Halloween movie. I love Jamie Lee Curtis. 
Jesus, Cleo. With a shrug, Cleo topped off her wine. I wasn't what you'd call sanguine about it at the time. Then everything stopped. The slamming, the banging, the screaming. And I felt this cold, a whoosh of it. Did you see my hair when I came out? It blew right through it. Then you texted, so either Grandma's charm or you coming home or both shut her off. I wish I could have some wine, Anna murmured. I dedicate this glass to you and your adorable baby bump. I'm going to white sage down there, Cleo decided. I don't think that's nearly enough, but I'll do it anyway. Already at home, she put her feet up on the empty chair, turned to Anna. So how many weeks along are you? Almost 20. Halfway. Cleo lifted her glass in toast. Do you know the variety? With a laugh, Anna patted her baby belly. We just found out yesterday. Think pink. As easy as that, Sonia thought, they transitioned from hauntings to babies. Engaging others stood as one of Cleo's top skills. Who runs the world? Cleo sang. Got a name? The middle name's easy. My mother-in-law's first name and my mom's middle is Kate. For the first name, we've got our list down to, oh, about a dozen. We're hoping to tighten that up before she starts preschool. But now that we know, decorating the nursery is top of the list. And since I happen to know an artist or two, I may hit them up for advice. I'm there. Now Sonia laughed. Cleo's a baby magnet. Or babies are a magnet for Cleo. Was helping with nursery decor what you wanted to talk to me about? Oh no, that one just came to me. It was some other things. One was about work. They can wait. Now's fine. Did you want something changed on the website? Not a change. Bay Arts is having their May Day open house in a few weeks, and I'm one of the featured artists. I wondered if we could do something to promote it on my site. Not only could, but should. Sonia took out her phone to take notes. Dates? Times? Second weekend in May, 10 to 8 on Saturday, noon to 6 on Sunday. It's annual? They do a weekend every year. Second weekend in May, and for the holidays, the second weekend in December. Featured artists, some demonstrations, specials, refreshments, door prizes. Nodding, Sonia got it all down. They'll do their own promotions, flyers, but we can do a flash on your social media. Do they include online sales? Absolutely. Okay, we'll do a card to include in the sales off your site, hyping it up. That's good. I wouldn't have thought of that. That's my job. I can send you some options tomorrow. She set her phone aside. What else is on your mind? The other was, well, it's personal. I'll just go haul another suitcase upstairs. No, don't leave. Anna said as Cleo started to get up. It's clear the two of you are close, so you'd know Sonia and Trey are seeing each other. Cautious, Sonia trailed a finger around the rim of her glass. He told you? No, and he wouldn't unless I asked directly. But you've had dinners together at the lobster cage, and he's made the turn on Manor Road several times lately. She smiled, shrugged. News doesn't travel in Pools Bay, it sprints. Do you have a problem with Trey and me? Oh, God, no. In a pushback gesture, Anna lifted her hands. The opposite, polar opposite. I love my brother, even when I want to kick him in the balls. He's so damn reasonable. You can't win a fight against his unwavering reasonable. It's frustrating, but I love him anyway. Reasonable, Sonia agreed. And the calm, the absolute calm. It's both annoying and admirable. It's annoyingly admirable. There, see? You get him. On the table, Sonia's phone sang out, what a man. Easing back, Anna crossed her arms over her baby bump. Do you ever get used to that? Somehow you do. Not sure I would, and it makes me really miss wine. But in any case, I'm happy Trey's with someone who gets him. I caught the carefully contained sparkage between you and we all had dinner, but I'm surprised he moved on that before Christmas. I might have nudged the timetable up a bit. And again, there. Reaching over, she squeezed Sonia's hand. It's not as if either of you need my approval, but you've got it anyway. 
And I have to go. I didn't intend to stay so long. This was really nice, she added as she rose. My best friend moved to Montana last summer. I miss her even more than wine, margaritas, and a second cup of coffee. Is she looking for a cowboy? Cleo wondered as they walked to the door. In Lena's case, that would be a cowgirl. Since she's working on a ranch, childhood dream, I bet she finds one. Come back, Sonia told her. You don't need a reason. I will. Carol King's You've Got a Friend played from the tablet in the library. Despite that, welcome to Pools Bay and Lost Pride Manor, Cleo. After Anna walked to her car, Sonia shut the door. And here we are. With a woo, Cleo threw her arms around her friend. I'm officially living in a haunted house. Talk about living the dream. I say it's not official until you're unpacked. Then let's get to it. Sonia took the weekender and one of the boxes while Cleo dragged the second big suitcase. Considering your wardrobe, I realized the closet in your room. You still want the same room? It's my room. The box goes up to the studio. Just set it down there.